Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Planning Subcommittee. My name is Barbara Blake. I'm the chair of this committee, and I'm also a Seven Sisters ward councillor. Um, if we can have a quick round of introductions, please, starting with, um, well, to my left, the vice chair of this committee. My name is Reg Rice, councillor for North Thornton Hill Ward and vice chair of this body. And if we can start with the committee, the front table first, please, and then the back. Councillor Luke Corley Harrison. Councillor Yvonne Say, White Hart Lane Ward. Councillor Nicola Bartlett, West Greenwood. Uh, Councillor Lester Buxton, Crouch M Ward. Councillor Ajda Ovat, Northumberland Park Ward. Matt White, Councillor for Tottenham Central. Thank you. Um, I'll ask the officers um, to introduce themselves, starting left to right. Justin Farley, Legal Officer. Rob Shostovsky, Assistant Director for Planning, Building Standards and Sustainability. Robbie McNocker, Head of Development Management and Planning Enforcement. Chris Smith, Principal Planning Officer. Fiona Ray, Acting Committees Manager. Thank you. Um, there are um, officers in attendance uh, virtually and they will introduce themselves um, when it's relevant. So moving on then to item one, this is about filming at meetings. Um, this meeting is being recorded. All registered speakers should be aware that they will be recorded for live or subsequent broadcast via the council's internet site or by anyone attending the meeting. Item two is the planning protocol. Uh, members and speakers are requested to note the information set out at item two on the agenda. And I ask you to um, uh, note that information. Um, item three, do we have any oh, uh, apologies? We have apologies for absence from councillors George Dunstall and councillor Alexandra Worrell. There are no items of urgent business. So we're on to item five. Um, this is declarations of interest. Do members have any declarations of interest? No, good. So item six is to approve the minutes of the meeting held of the meetings held on the 7th of March and the 17th of March, 2022. Are they approved? Approved. Thank you. Um, item seven is the uh, planning applications. That's just for reference. So we're now on to item, uh, item eight, which is um, uh, the Cranwood uh, 100 Woodside Avenue. Um, uh, and that's um, the proposal. Uh, uh, Christopher Smith, the planning officer, is going to present this report. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. This application is for the development of the former Cranwell Care Home at 100 Woodside Avenue in Muswell Hill. Uh, the following are the key features of the development. Uh, so the development is for the demolition of the existing vacant care home. There are three new buildings of three, four and six storeys. That includes 41 new homes, 32 for council rent, which is 79% by habitable room. Eight homes uh, would have three or more bedrooms, 19.5% of the total. Five homes are for wheelchair users, which is 12.2% of the total. All units are dual aspect at, at a minimum. The floor, blue badge, parking space is provided, play and amenity space, and improved access to Parkland Walk. Uh, so the application site is located on the southern side of Woodside Avenue at the junction with Muswell Hill Road. 
The site is adjacent to terraced housing and Highgate Wood to the south, Parkland Walk to the east and a primary school to the west. The northern side of Woodside Avenue is located within the Muswell Hill Conservation Area. These images uh, show how the site appears from Muswell Hill Road, Woodside Avenue and Parkland Walk. Harringay's development plan identifies the site for new residential development as part of the SA51 site allocation. Improved connectivity between Highgate Wood and Parklands Walk is another key objective of the site allocation. The proposal is for an entirely residential development formed of three blocks. Block A is the largest block of five storeys in height plus roof accommodation. Block A contains all of the council rented affordable housing units. Block B is a four storey block on the western side of the site. Block C includes two terrace dwelling houses. The existing terrace houses to the south of the development, the development proposal are within the site allocation area and do not form part of this application. An indicative master plan has been submitted with the application which shows how the terraced houses could be incorporated into a comprehensive redevelopment of the whole site allocation in the future. As such, this application complies with the master planning requirements of policy DM55. The development proposal will provide improved access to Parkland Walk by increasing the number of connections into the route and by providing qualitative improvements from it to Highgate Wood. This meets a key site allocation requirement. The development would appear as a four storey building with set back roof accommodation when viewed from surrounding streets. This image shows how the building would look in the surrounding urban context from the south on Muswell Hill Road, which currently includes a four storey terrace uh, series of properties. The design of the development proposal is supported by the quality review panel. This image shows the proposed development as it would appear from the north on Muswell Hill Road. The building would be finished in materials reflective of those in the local area. The massing of Block A would be reduced by a spacious central access core. New street trees would be planted to further soften the building's appearance. This image shows the proposed development from the west on Woodside Avenue. The internal layout and windows for Block B have been designed to prevent overlooking towards the adjacent school. The development has been designed to be tenure blind so that the visual difference between the council rented and market, so sorry, so that there is no visual difference between the council rented and market housing. The development would include a lower ground floor level, which would provide natural surveillance onto the refurbished Parkland Walk. At ground level, a significant increase in tree planting and soft landscaping is proposed. The existing east-west route through the site would be widened and planted. Plain amenity space is provided for residents within this area. The arrangement of the buildings into three distinct blocks with the central core separating the two parts of Block A means that all homes would be dual aspect and natural light provided to all dwellings. Uh, sorry, the, the level of natural light provided to all dwellings would be maximised. Passive house certification is expected for Block A, which will minimise energy demand for these council rented units. The development as a whole will be close to zero carbon. So to summarise the development, the development, sorry, um, the new residential development is in, is in accordance with site allocation SA51. 41 new homes in total are provided, 79% by habitable room will be council rent homes. 19.5% uh, of the homes would be of three or more bedrooms and 12% would be wheelchair user homes. The development is, a, is of a high residential quality with dual aspect homes in a tenure blind, in a tenure blind development. There would be very high energy efficiency levels uh, with passive house certification sought. Uh, amenity and play spaces provided on the site. The quality review panel stated that this is an exceptionally well designed Thought, thoughtfully composed, elegantly proportioned, complementarily materialed and detailed development. It respects the adjacent conservation area and there would be no detrimental impact on the immunity of nearby residents. There would be improved access to Parkland Walk, improved routes through the site and new tree planting and landscaping. It is a, a car free development with four off street blue badge parking spaces provided. It is in close proximity to Highgate Underground Station and there's high quality cycle parking provided as well. Therefore, the uh, recommendation is that the development is considered acceptable and is in, in accordance with policy. So officers recommend the committee results to grant planning permission 
subject to conditions and planning obligations as set out in the committee report. Thank you. Thank you. Um, if I can now um, turn to the applicants, could you please introduce yourselves before you speak? Sorry, sorry. Um, so do we have, um, sorry about that, Councillor Gordon. Um, do we have any clarification questions from the committee? please. And if you do, can you please uh, refer to the paragraph in the report that you're seeking clarification on to the officer? Thank you. Count <laughs> Councillor Say. I just want, would like a brief explanation as to passive house and what it means. Um, I can't remember where it is in there. Um, I'm also a, a bit concerned about the um, it not being a zero carbon. But then we come on to that, won't we? Um, Passive House is about um, air tightness in the uh, the buildings themselves, and it's about uh, keeping the energy efficiency of the building as, as high as possible, providing natural light so that demand for um, energy is is as, as low as possible in those those properties. Are there any other uh, questions of clarification from the committee? No. Okay. So um, we now move on to the objectors. Um, you have three minutes each to speak, and if you could kindly introduce yourself before you speak. Thank you. Good evening and thank you for the opportunity to speak. My name is David Staples and I speak this evening on behalf of Woodside Square, a mixed tenure development directly opposite Cranwood House. I must start by saying that we support the redevelopment of the Cranwood site for mixed tenure housing, but we object to the current proposals as the height and scale of the buildings proposed are too high and too big. The design has significant shortcomings and makes a negative contribution to the area. Haringey's development plan sets out goals that the proposed development fails to meet. Policy DM1B says, development proposals shall relate positively to neighboring structures, having regard to building heights, form, scale, and massing. The majority of buildings in this part of Muswell Hill are three or four storeys in height. The proposed development is six storeys. The design officer noted it is a break from the norm of the prevailing low-rise suburban residential neighbourhood. He then attempts, in a convoluted fashion, to argue that building A is only four storeys high, not counting the lower ground floor, or the top floor in the roof. These arguments are specious. Policy DM1A says, all new de development must achieve a high standard of design. The officer's report says, these proposals are an exceptionally high quality design. The officer is wrong. These proposals are not of an exceptionally high quality. Specifically, Flats on higher floors in Building A are high access from open walkways. Streets in the sky emerged as a concept in 1951 and morphed into deck access. They have had problems and have fallen out of favour. Why is Haringey perpetuating, perpetuating such an outdated design concept? Building A has a heavy mansard roof. Roof lines throughout Muswell Hill are varied with interesting gables. The few mansard roofs are small and articulated. There is nothing of the scale proposed. 
Building A is not set back sufficiently from the road. It will be overpowering. All buildings on Woodside Avenue, the schools, Thames Water, Centre for Autism and Housing are set back significantly. Policy DM1 also says proposals will confidently address feedback from local consultation. The consultation elicited 244 responses of which 93% were opposed to this scheme. The consultation was ignored. Mr Staples, um, you had three minutes and your three minutes is up now. Can I have two more sentences, Chair? Go on then. Um, this development does harm. You should send this back to the developer, instructing them to reduce the brief, which is the biggest problem, address the design concerns and resubmit. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Mr Staples. Thank you. So are there any um, uh, other objectors who are speaking, who are listed here? Do we have Michael Gabay here? Is Michael Gabay? Michael would be next on the list. If he's not here, we have one other objector who's not a councillor first who's joining online. Uh, there might just be a brief pause while we set him up. Uh, so that's Mark Simons. Okay. So we have Mark Simons who is speaking virtually. That's just being set up now. So there'll be a slight delay whilst we do that. Thank you, Mark. You should be able to unmute your microphone and speak to the committee now. Mark, uh, you're. Yep, yeah, there you are. Perfect. Uh, okay. You have three Hi. minutes. Thank you. Okay. Um, I'm interested in the definition. It's a car free development. My objection mainly revolves around the parking. It revolves around the fact that there's no basement car parking, which is a provision for private development um, and seems to have been completely ignored in connection with this application. Um, there have been numerous objections over the years and the application fails to address any in particular the overdevelopment of the site which by my reckoning is 117 habitable rooms per acre uh, i've been in the property business for some many years and um, when we are dealing with sites that is considered exceptional um, the main problem as far as i'm concerned and i think i speak i can't say on behalf of but i know it's a uh, a view that's shared from discussion um, the problem being the parking. Uh, the report talks about parking as being the survey relates only to evening parking. And indeed, it is correct. In the evening, parking around neighbourhood, uh, neighbouring roads is not an issue. The problem about parking is during the day. One of the issues is that um, looking through some of the Haringey documentation, they require a CPZ, a central par uh, uh, parking zone, um, in situations where there are uh, provisions that there can be no on-site parking. Consequently, in my opinion, there needs to be a solution to the proposal that follows the rule of law that says that there should be basement parking, as there is at Woodside Square. There should be a central parking zone to prevent the uh, flow of cars encroaching upon roads that currently don't have them. And this is something that is 50-50 split amongst local residents. But if you are going to go ahead with this, in my opinion, you should be considering a section 106. You should not allow the application to be granted in its current form on the grounds of overdevelopment and the parking and you should allow for the fact that you need consultation with neighbours 
to find out whether we can in fact agree on a CPZ because that is the only way under the way you are proposing this that it would be fair and reasonable. You are providing 75 car park, uh, cycle parks for disabled parking and none for other residents and you say in your document that the you will make sure people buying the property will be told it's very difficult to park in the area and that should be sufficient to put them off. In my opinion, this development is biased. I believe that there should be more consultation and the person who spoke before, I cannot agree more with what he said. Thank you, Mr. Simons. Thank you very much. So we uh, we now have, we move on to um, the councillors to speak. You have so that's councillor Cathy Brennan. You have three minutes. Co-production. Of the 230-odd objections from Muswell Hill residents to the planned building at Cranwood, every resident I spoke to was in favour of more social housing at proper social rents. Objections largely related to the size, massing, and the fact that the appearance does not fit with the architecture of Muswell Hill. Most objectors have objected to the previous plans and feel their objections have not been heard. Our council is aiming to practice co-production and work with Haringey gay communities. My understanding of co-production is that the council should listen to residents and try to work with them. The building in its planned form is being imposed on the residents of Muswell Hill. The points below come from residents' suggestions and were serious consideration given to these points with the project still going ahead, I would change my objection to support. Fitting with surrounding architecture. New buildings should match the area. The buildings throughout Muswell Hill are red and white, not just brick red. To fit with this architecture, some white should be incorporated into the facade, e.g. different coloured brickwork, white included in the decorative bands, windows or doors picked out in white. The top floor or another floor be white. This would contribute to a lighter area feel to the building, connect the decoration more clearly to other Muswell Hill buildings. Greening. In line with Harringay's green agenda, we should green this building. The Friends of the Parkland Walk suggested a living wall facing the Parkland Walk. I support this suggestion. There could also be a living wall on the side wall of Building A, which is largely plain brick and is visible from the north along Muswell Hill Road. A living wall here would make the building fit with Highgate Woods and make a beautiful feature to be seen from a distance. The Friends have suggested that, a grey water, that grey water from the building should be collected and used to feed a pond on the Parkland Walk, adding a bonus feature. It's a quid pro quo. Friends of the Parkland Walk consultation response. In the Friends detailed consultation response, point three concerns, they raised SUDS compliance of the hard landscaping to prevent flooding of the Parkland Walk, and they asked for acoustic hoarding all around the construction and temporary, temporary drainage while it's being built to protect the users of the Parkland Walk. The quality review panel advice on massing on development and density from section 5.1 of the Statement of Community Involvement. So on massing and bulk, the glimpsed views of Highgate Woods are twice strongly recommended. Please consider how to address this. The living wall being reminiscent of the woods may help. Fitting with surrounding architecture and reducing massing. The frontage of building A facing Muswell Hill Road makes a feature of square brick or cement balconies, a style totally out of place in the architecture of the area. If these balconies were lightened and in the style of the area, vertical brick bricked columns replaced with metal supports, the surrounds of the balcony is also light and decorative, then the front of the actual building would be visible, the building massing would appear lighter, the building without moving would appear to be further back from the wall. This might also let extra light into the flats. Councillor Brennan, your three minutes is up. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you. So we now have um, Councillor Scott Emery, who I believe is you're standing in for Councillor Pippa Connor. So you have three minutes, Councillor Emery. Thank you, Chair. Uh, as you said, I am here speaking on behalf of Pippa Connor. Unfortunately, Councillor Connor is currently dealing with a family bereavement and has asked me to speak on her behalf. As a former Muswell Hill councillor, however, I am quite familiar with this development, but please take the following views as that of Councillor Connors. 
Social housing is something that is vitally important to our residents, and I would like to say that it is good to see its inclusion on this site. I note that in the hundreds of objections to this development, that this sentiment, sentiment is echoed by nearly everyone. While on this point, however, I believe it would be an improvement if mixed tenure blocks were the standard with both social and private housing mixed. My main objection to this, however, comes from the lack of response to the many comments and objections raised by residents during the engagement process. I cannot see a single change between the original proposals and the final offer. The height and bulk of Block A would crowd out the street and dominate the border of the conservation area. This design is not in keeping with the Edwardian design seen in this area. Under Haringey Development Management DPD 2017, the policy DM1 delivering high quality design states that all new development and changes of use must achieve a high standard of design and contribute to the distinctive character and amenity of the local area. Specifically with regard to building heights, B form and scale and massive and massing prevailing around the site. I would argue that Block A contravenes policy DM1 outlined above due to the materially different height, bulk and design. The proposal actively detracts rather than contributes to the distinctive character and amenity of the area. There are other points I also believe are worth mentioning. The 20 trees that are planned to be felled. The advisability of raised walkways potentially increasing risk for residents within the development. Increasing local traffic in this area with many nearby schools, this needs to be carefully considered in terms of the security and safety of those children. The lack of parking has already been mentioned, putting a huge strain on already limited street parking. In summary, I support my residents' concerns around the current development and would argue that a more sympathetic design in keeping with the conservation area of Muswell Hill would be welcomed. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Emery. So we now have uh, clarification questions from the committee. Any members of the committee have any questions, please? Um, so we have uh, Councillor Rice. I, I would like to hear from the design officer what he says about the design of this premises. So there have been lots of comment about the design, and I'm sure the committee could be understanding could be improved for the contribution from the design officer. Chair, if I could just bring in our, our design officer, Richard Truscott, to um, respond to that. Oh. Hi. Hi, everyone. Uh, yes. Um, was there anything specific, or do you want me to just comment on the um, design queries raised by uh, people like the objectors? Right. The, the height, for instance. So the height, um, I consider the height is compatible with some of the context and is a is a gentle, modest step up from some of the other context. Uh, the height approximately matches the uh, the row of, of of shops with flats above immediately to the south on Muswell Hill Road. So that's an established context for that height. Um, it, it represents a, 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 an increase in one or two stories on the, um, the heights further up Muswell Hill Road and along Woodside Avenue, um, but then that, those properties are in the conservation area, so they're more sensitive. It's, this is outside of the conservation area, so it's reasonable to step up a floor. Uh, they, the, the site also takes the opportunity of being built basically in, in an existing railway cutting to ha drop a floor as well, to have a, to have a lower ground floor. Um, but that floor will not be seen from the street, so it doesn't... Um, contribute to the apparent height as seen from the street. So I would consider it a, it's a compatible height. In terms of design, um, it reinterprets the um, existing features of the neighbourhood. I think the architects are here and they will probably be best to explain it. I mean, as design officer and as planning officers, we don't seek to impose strict design guidelines on, on developers um, exactly what um, is it stylistic flourishes they use for their architraves and, 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 and um, window designs, but we do seek to um, negotiate with them a design that is compatible with the area, whilst being a modern reinterpretation of the variety of different contextual styles in the area. And clearly bay windows, balconies, uh, mansard roofs are one of the are features that are found in the area. 
um, particularly in, the, in some of the mansion blocks in the area. So that, that, that represents an acceptable approach to um, doing a, a, a contemporary reinterpretation. And we do consider it a, a really good quality design. It's by a very well respected architect's practice and the quality review panel have agreed with uh, me and fellow officers that it's a really high quality design. QRP, the quality review panel, is, is a panel of independent experts, uh, architects, urban designers, and other built environment professionals without any particular, and without any, in, any involvement in, in, in the development, just providing an objective view with their expertise. And they agree that it's a good quality design. I think I've covered all the design issues there. Thank you. Councillor White. Thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, I just wanted to clarify with Councillor Brennan. Uh, I possibly it wasn't able to hear because it's slightly noisy from the window here. Um, but I believe you were asking for consideration to be given to um, greening the outside of the building. Is that is that correct with a kind of green wall? And I, I just wondered if you could clarify exactly where on the building you were asking for that to be done. There's a wall that faces the Parkland um, Walk, and that would be viewed by people on the Parkland Walk, so it would actually enhance their experience and make the whole bulking much less threatening. Um, and there's also Building A, as you walk up the road from Muswell Hill on board Building A, there's the side wall of Building A is very visible as you walk up from the church. And if you put a living wall, and there's only two small windows on that wall. So if you did that wall as a living wall, it would become a design feature and it would remind you of Highgate Woods as well. Um, and I just think that it could make it much more beautiful because the modern design is not in keeping with Muswell, I have to say. But the living wall would, would bring out Highgate Woods. Thank you, thanks. Thank you, Councillor Bevan. Yeah, if I can ask the design officer to say a few more words about the quality review panel, because I noticed that this scheme has gone to those panels three times, which in my experience is most unusual. I haven't come across a scheme that's actually gone before a panel of experts three times. So their recommendations have been responded to and implemented, which you can see on page 15. So can you confirm for me, Richard, that this, this scheme has had the most intense uh, design issues uh, inspected and commented on by our panel of experts three times? And I understand they actually made physical site visits as well. Yes, thanks, Councillor Bevan. Yes, I can confirm that they, have, they did make a physical site visit and um, Yes, they, they, they reviewed it three times. It's not unknown. We, we, I think uh, the Argent scheme at uh, Tottenham Hale was reviewed seven times, but uh, it's, 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 it's certainly a, a very thorough series of reviews that it's had, and it led to improvements. Uh, improvements, for instance, to the uh, access balconies, uh, the so-called deck access, uh, to make sure that they are um, well overlooked from within the flats and well screened from the street, and that the lighting will be... Um, concealed so you don't get to that bright light shining out into the street from the from the access balconies um, which are quite short as well and that was also a key point in, in, in about the access balconies yeah I mean you're absolutely right it has been reviewed very thoroughly thank you councillor Corley Harrison yeah I also had a question of councillor Brennan um, quite a lot of your opening was in regards to adding more white design to the building it's got quite a lot of white um, detailing to me, so I'd be interested in understanding a little bit more about what additional white design you would need for you to be supportive of the application.
if that is the case, then I must apologise for what I've got. I blew up at what I got off the website and I could see absolutely no white. I could only see red. I could see um, design features which were intricate black and white sort of banding on the brickwork, but I couldn't actually see white as as is very prominent in Muswell Hill because it's nothing subtle about the white decoration in Muswell Hill. I, I so I, I maybe maybe there is white that I haven't seen, but I certainly haven't seen it on the building. But thank you, Councillor Buxton. Thank you, Chair. Uh, can I have a quick clarification on um, uh, what changes were made uh, post the residents' feedback from an officer? Chair, for me, I think that would be a good question to put to the applicant team um, following their um, presentation. Um, I think they could, they could probably give more detail. I think Richard has touched on, on some of those, but um, as planning officers, we um, won't have been specifically involved in that. We will have shaped things through the pre-application discussions, but the specifics that um, residents raised in the earlier consultation outside of the planning process um, would be a good question for the applicant. Any other um, clarification from the committee? Okay, Councillor Rice. Yeah, there have been comments about the transport and the car-free zone area. Could the transport officer perhaps comment on that, please? Chair, for me, um, we have our transport officer online. Um, Stefan, if if, um, if you're available just to um, address some of the points around um, car-free development and um, the number of spaces on site. Um, yes, certainly, Robbie. Um, Councillor Rice, so the, the proposed development is not eligible for car-free status because of the PTAL, which is too low. It's only two. And the threshold is usually set at four or above. Um, and also the site is not in a CPZ. Um, this was uh, mentioned earlier by somebody else. Um, there are proposals to extend, to create a new CPZ, but that won't include the, the site. So there aren't any plans in the future to make it uh, eligible for CAFRI development. So we are not able to restrict access uh, of future residents to uh, uh, parking on street. I'm not quite clear what's been said. Is this area within a CPZ or is the intention to bring it into the CPZ? The, the area the site is in is not in a CPZ at the moment. Um, I know there have been consultations for a new CPZ uh, adjacent to the site, but the site itself is not included in any uh, future CPZ uh, as far as I know. There may be plans in the future, but I, I can't comment on uh, on future plans. If you haven't got a CPZ, um, how then do you control the parking during the daytime? What's been commented on? How is that going to be controlled during the daytime without a CPZ? We cannot control parking uh, without a, a CPZ. Indeed, you're right. So thank you for that point of those points of clarification. Um, so there are no more um, questions from the clarification questions from the committee. So we now move on to supporters, followed by the applicant. So it's now you, Councillor Gordon. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you, Chair. I just wanted to make a few points really. My name is Councillor Ruth Gordon and I'm the cabinet member responsible for house building, placemaking and development in Haringey Council. And um, I think somebody earlier on referred to this, um, that this should be sent back to the developer. Well, in this case, we're talking about the council and the council's ambition to build council homes for the many desperate people in this borough that are on our waiting list. I just would like to remind the committee that we've got 11,000 people in Haringey waiting for, desperately waiting for council housing. 3,000 of them are in temporary accommodation. And 
we are restricted in terms of what the council can do as to where we can build council houses. A lot of council houses are being built in the east of the borough because that's where we own the land. And we've got an opportunity with this particular site to build council houses in the west of the borough, which are absolutely and desperately needed. And um, that was one of the reasons why we have been looking at this site for some time. Um, I would say that this is, you know, not a, a huge um, a development site, um, and it won't be the biggest one that the council brings forward, but it is a sizable one, and it's an important one as part of our house building program. Um, what I would say, in addition to that, is that we're enormously proud, I'm certainly proud in this, as a cabinet member of the house building programme that we've been embarking on for the past four years and will continue to in the next in this next administration. And I, I hope I can speak on behalf of the house building team of the officers that are represented here to say how proud they are of the house building programme. And the reason for that is not just because of the provision that we're making, but because of the high quality. And it's part of a, the mark of this administration, the, in the council administration and our building, house building programme, that we want to set a high bar as far as quality of housing provision is concerned. And we think that this particular scheme meets that high bar. Um, you know, the, some of the aspects that we've talked about, we're very, very close to zero carbon on this, uh, on this scheme. But the certification of passive house, I think, is really important. And I wanted to just spend a little time, if I may, Chair, on this particular aspect of it, because it means that we will be providing out of the 41 homes, 32 will be council homes. So that's 75 percent of the scheme will be council homes and they will be passive house certified. Now, what does that mean? I think one of the committee members was asking that question and you know, it, it's a sort of a word that doesn't sort of trip off the lips very easily. But what it means in essence is that you have things like triple glazing, that you have um, high levels of insulation so that you're not losing heat from the homes, that you have the orientation of the building to take the best advantage of where the sun is coming in and the designs cater for making sure that the, the homes aren't overheated. So essentially what you get is warm homes in the winter and cool homes in the summer. Councillor Gordon, um, I'm sorry, I should have said that you have just three minutes and your three minutes is up. My three now. minutes is up. I would just ask for your support for recommending um, permission to be, to be granted. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor. So we now have the applicants uh, to respond. And, and that's 15 minutes. Um, as we had one speaker not speak today, it's actually going to be eight. It's going to be eight and a half minutes, um, deducting the time that Councillor Gordon spoke in support. So when you're ready, that will be eight and a half minutes. Right. Okay. So when you're ready, could you introduce yourselves, please, um, before you speak? So over to you. Eight and a half minutes. Um, my name is Jo McCafferty. I'm a director at Lever Bernstein Architects and we led on the architectural design and landscape. Um, so I'm going to introduce the scheme a little, a lot of which has been covered. Um, but the, um, in, in a summary, the proposals for the 0.4 hectare Cranwood site create very high quality and highly sustainable new homes in this key location for the, for the borough. 32 of these homes, 78% by dwelling, are social rented tenure, as has been mentioned with the nine uh, remaining being private sale. They're all designed as tenure blind, which is an incredibly important aspect of the proposals. And as has been, as has been mentioned, the social rented homes are de designed to be fully certified passive house standards, which is groundbreaking for this part of the borough and the borough generally. The development has a very strong landscape focus, which we may well come to, creating 830 square meters, which is 21% of the site of new green space in a central courtyard, which all homes open onto. The approach connects the wider green network by improving the Parkland Walk access route. And this includes new public steps to the north and improves the safety of the route through overlooking and new lighting to the ramped access to the south. New trees are provided throughout 
and especially those maximizing value to natural wildlife, carefully integrated with the woodland edge. Also, SUDS has been mentioned this evening, and there is a very strong and carefully integrated sustainable urban drainage strategy across the site. The existing public route through the site is maintained for local residents, another key important factor. And parking, which I'm sure we'll discuss again, is provided for wheelchair users with four spaces with a service bay located on site for delivery and maintenance vehicles. Substantial secure cycle parking is also included to comply with new standards set out in the London plan. The proposals have been designed and tested through this rigorous pre-application process and the three QRPs as has been discussed already. And it should be said that during those three QRP processes in the pre-application process, the scale of the buildings was one aspect which was substantially reduced from the first QRP. Alongside that, a lot of detail, refinement, material choices and re responses to the conservation area were taken on board. Alongside this, there were lots of townscape views and sunlight daylight technical modelling. The form, scale and, and section and footprint of the buildings responds very carefully to the site's geometry and that of the adjacent street pattern and the complex topography of the site, which was created, as has been said, by the original Cranley Gardens rail station and platform, which once stood in this location. The upper floor of Building A, which addresses both Woodside Avenue and Muswell Hill Road, is handled, yes, as a mansard, but this enables the top floor of accommodation to be tucked within the roofscape with folded in dormer windows. And this means that from Muswell Hill Road, um, the building appears as a four-storey building with the top floor set within the roofscape. In addition, in terms of how the building has been designed, that top storey is the top level of a series of maze nets, and this means that no balconies are required at that level, um, and that further reduces the massing impact. These things have been very carefully considered through the pre-app process. Not only is the form of the buildings crafted from a response to this specific nature of the site, site, its constraints, so for example, the levels I've discussed, the interface with Parkland Walk, and also a water main that crosses the site from east-west, but also the drive to make the development so sustainable and to reduce energy bills for local residents. Therefore, the proposals are 100% dual aspect, and that does mean that as in creating um, dwellings that are dual aspect, gallery access is required. But as has been discussed, the galleries have been very carefully detailed and designed so that they serve a few number of homes. And also, we've employed this canted bay, which deals with both the balconies to create privacy and enclosure to make those balconies very usable spaces and very loved and cherished by their residents, but also to make the gallery accesses social spaces that are also protected and held within the body of the building. Brick detailing, bespoke metalwork and ceramic tiling all further help enrich the facades to create a truly crafted series of, of, of contextual but also contemporary buildings. And care has been taken to detail dwelling thresholds and boundaries to foster a real sense of neighbourliness between homes. Individual front doors on Woodside Avenue create activity and help, help um, the, the street level security, as has been raised already. And also the handling of overlooking and privacy at low levels has been carefully considered with a secure by design officer. The interface with the school we've touched on, but all balconies are orientated away from the school facing facade. All glazing to homes on the school facing elevations have raised sills at 1125 millimetres with built in furniture below to pull people away from those window spaces. And the top floor, um, the top story is designed as a, um, a mansard again, which again um, means the glazing is further set back. In addition to that, a number of trees, new tree planting has been discussed with the school to be planted on their side of the school boundary to, to further soften the facade. So in summary, the proposals are really groundbreaking in their sustainability credentials. They're very carefully crafted in form and have been heavily scrutinized. And they integrate a highly biodiverse native landscape, which marks a real step change in the quality of mixed tenure housing provision in the borough. Thank you. Um, perhaps, Simon, you would like to talk about some of the, the parking issues? 
So it's uh, Simon Keating from uh, Civic Engineers with the transport consultants on the project. Um, we undertook a healthy street. Could you speak up a bit, please? It's difficult to hear you. Sorry. So it's um, Simon Keating from Civic Engineers with the transport consultants on the project. We undertook a healthy streets transport assessment to determine the site suitability um, it, to access uh, local transport bus and uh, underground services, but also the amenities which are rel relatively uh, in proximity to the site. So ac excellent access to town centre, shops, uh, schools um, and a green space amenity. So it's part of a, of a you know, 15 minute neighbourhood, which is uh, TFL and Harangay's objectives for new developments and um, parking of four disabled spaces is based on the London plan provision for providing 10% of units with a disabled parking space. And um, this is based also on Harangay's blue badge statistics, which is, uh, which is around 2.9% of the population. So it's a, an over provision in, in that respect, but also uh, ties in with the number of uh, disabled um, homes being provided. Also loading facilities will be provided on site um, and a turning circle so to minimize uh, servicing from the high street uh, through the, throughout the whole process we've been in consultation with the transport and waste um, officers to determine an appropriate servicing strategy for the development and this has been considered from from the outset and gone through a rigorous uh, pre-app uh, process to support sustainable transport um, a framework travel plan has been produced uh, 75 uh, high quality, safe and secure cycle parking uh, spaces are provided on plot and also future residents will be provided um, with access to local uh, car clubs which operate in the area. So the, in essence, to summarise, it's a highly um, sustainable uh, location to access both public transport and um, local amenities. Thank you. That's your eight and a half minutes um, up. So can I ask for any clarification questions from the committee? Um, can I just say, Councillor Buxton, have you had your point? Was your point clarified? Uh, no, so I would like to get it clarified okay. again. Okay, and then I'll bring you in, Councillor. Yeah. Uh, so would you like me to repeat it? Uh, yeah, so with the um, uh, responses from residents, uh, what has been uh, substantially changed about the uh, about the project. Um, the scheme throughout has been um, refined. I think from, from the very beginning, we reduced the scale of the buildings through the pre-application process, as I've described, from substantially higher, but also following um, the engagement with, with residents. There were meetings with those from the Parkland Walk. Um, there's been refinement around the, um, the landscape strategy and the handling of the Parkland Walk, and also refinement of the balcony design, um, the integration of, of paler materials um, in the facades, um, and uh, yes, uh, uh, the kind of refinement of that. There's also been engagement with the school, um, uh, both to reassure them about the design of Building B and uh, show them the internal arrangements so that it's very clear that um, uh, the sills are raised and the, the built-in furniture pulls people back from those uh, windows and also to discuss with them more tree planting on their side of the boundary. Councillor Corley Harrison. Yeah, I've got a few questions. Um, First a point, Councillor Gordon, we know that there's a council housing shortage, but we want the best design. So we won't be blackmailed into making a decision based on the number of council homes that are desperately needed. Um, question to the applicants. The point was raised about the proximity to the road earlier and effectively the depth of the front gardens or frontages. So I'd just like more detail on the reasoning for that because a setting back would give um, less of an oppressive feel on the on on the roadside on the addition of the gallery access you touched on it I, I don't believe that they're generally supported by the council due to historical issues ASB overlooking and that sort of thing 
what other options were explored before a gallery um, was decided upon. In terms of the overlooking from block B on the school, which you just referenced there at the end, um, there is a diagram that has some arrows showing the direction, I think, of overlooking, um, which I'm sure that I could find. And it shows that um, overlooking, it's on page 59, uh, it shows that the angle is determined by not being able to see past built-in furniture. But of course, that could be removed at any point because block B, presumably anyone could change their furniture as, as they like. So has the overlooking um, detail been provided with someone up against the windows without furniture in place? I'd like to understand the provision for waste and bin collection because um, I couldn't find a huge amount of detail on that in the pack. Um, and some more information on parking. From what I've inferred from the pack, there's an indication that 14 parking spaces are to be used on street. Um, so I'm wondering what that's based on, given the number of units that are, you know, proposed here, and given the number of cars per home in Muswell Hill Ward, based on um, current figures. I'd also like to understand more about the disabled parking bays and the removal of parking from the existing terraced houses, um, whether they will have existing bays removed or not, whether they will have access to any of the four bays, because uh, the pack suggests that if the disabled bays aren't used on site, they would go to the family homes. Um, and what provision there is for adding additional disabled bays in in the future, should homes be adapted, um, presumably there's a provision of uh, adaptable homes. Um, if homes are to be adapted, will there be the possibility of adding more bays in? Thanks. Shall I take the first few of those and hand over to a colleague? Um, thank you. Um, in t dealing with the setback first, um, the as you, as you might appreciate, but. Um, if, for example, we provided substantial front gardens, as, as is evident in some local properties, not all, um, then the um, private amenity space for um, the de development would be considerably less. Um, what we've tried to do is work with the complex topo existing topography of the site. The reason for that is also so that the site drops as you as you well know very quickly away from Woodside Avenue and that's the reason for that is is because of the the existing the platform um, and we want to reduce the amount of spoil and soil that is taken away from the site so working with the topography is really important so what we've used what, we, what we've done is work with that topography um, the the key thing is also to enable front door access on street to help activate the street and that if you talk to any secure by design officer or police officer they will tell you that helps activate the street um, and so we've, we've designed the, the maze nets on those lower floors um, and that works very well with the levels so obviously level access at that point is incredibly important if if you push the whole building substantially back then you would end up with very loose large front gardens um, and um, and very little private community space those front gardens would be facing north onto woodside avenue rather than creating shared amenity space which is sunny and south facing to the rear of those family properties so that's why the building is is pulled forward um, for, for, for all of those reasons. In terms of the gallery access, we've looked really carefully at that. We design many buildings, lots of housing, as I'm sure you know, um, with gallery access. And one of the reasons for that is that those homes can be dual aspect and they can have cross ventilation and that they don't overheat. So that in the summer, you have a north facing facade with, with with um, light pouring in, but you also have a south facing facade and you can cross ventilate the home without any mechanical ventilation, which is obviously very important. 
So what we've tried to do is strike the right balance and ensure that there aren't a lot of homes off each gallery. And also because that's when we refer to streets in the sky, as, as was said earlier, that's where those problems align, where you have lots and lots of homes sharing that, that route or that space. And we've designed them so that those canted bays that you see, particularly on the Woodside ele um, Avenue elevation, they, they appear outside front doors. So people can actually use those spaces and that they feel sort of social spaces, but also very well cared for. They're very well overlooked by kitchens that face over at those spaces. Often again, something that wasn't achieved in those 1960s gallery access. So we have we have really thought about that. And our experience is working on um, on a similar housing projects is that actually as long as you ensure that a few number of dwellings share those galleries, they provide additional amenity space as well as cross ventilation of those homes. And the cross ventilation is critical in achieving passive house requirements, which all social homes in this development do, which is pretty extraordinary. And you can't do that with any other model of design. So single aspect homes will never achieve full passive house. I, th I think um, in terms of your point about the school, sorry, sorry, I'm talking too much, but um, in terms of the point of the school, um, uh, you you make an understandable point about the built-in furniture. What we've what we've tried to do is make sure that the majority of spaces that are most used aren't overlooking the school. So they're not primary habitable spaces, they're either secondary windows and if they, um, if we do have secondary windows, they have very high sills. So they're not, not windows that you can either lean out of, there aren't balconies, they're very much secondary windows to those spaces. Um, that's probably all I could say about that. Perhaps if I hand over to Simon to talk about the refuse and, and the, the engagement with Viola and the parking. Yeah, just to... Yeah, so just in, re in relation to the parking and um, the existing dwellings to the rear of the development, of the, there are eight dwellings. There's no allocated parking dedicated to those um, eight dwellings. The on-plot parking, which I believe there are six marked bays, the rest is informal or informally parked in. Those six marked bays were associated with the now non-operational uh, care home. Um, as regards the refuse strategy. This was uh, agreed with um, Harangay Waste and their uh, operator Veolia. Um, block A, the refuse store faces uh, Woodside Avenue and this will be serves, served from um, Woodside Avenue in order to allow this to occur. An extension of double yellow lining from the site entrance will be extended to provide uh, sufficient space for the refuse vehicle to pull up and be within the permitted haul distance from the bin store to the rear of the vehicle. Um, as regards the internal um, sites of so block A, S or B and C and the um, existing dwellings to the rear, the vehicle will operate as it currently does by reversing into the development and this has been as it currently occurs and has been agreed with Veolia, the, uh, the operator and the waste uh, colleagues or officers in Harringay. And as regards parking um, capacity, so we undertook a parking beat survey in October 2020 on two weekdays um, we covered both the uh, period when most residents are expected to be home so that's between four and five in the morning which uh, demonstrated that within the, the proximity of the site there are approximately 34 available parking spaces during the day um, this was down to uh, 23 spaces accounting for um, perhaps uh, pick up from the school for that, that period. So in the, in the worst case scenario during the day, there are 23 available spaces. Um, it was determined based on the transport classification of residents. It's a, a TFL um, document where you can profile the likely re residents and their, their likely transport choices that who the development is aimed at, both the uh, social housing element and the private sale element, uh, the three categories identified would have low car use 
and higher propensities to use public transport or sustainable travel measures. Um, again, the based on the site's accessibility to uh, underground stations, which is 1.2 kilometres, um, frequent ac uh, bus services to the um, underground station and proximity to uh, town centre amenities, schools, local shops, etc. Um, it's deemed that the site can support a low car or a car free um, development. <laughs> Um, okay, have, has the, you've signalled you want to speak again. Yes, yeah, has, has just the, one have, point of clarity, if I may. One point, okay, yeah. okay, um, councillor. It was when you were talking about there's an existing, was it eight bays and six bays for the current, six was for the, what was the care home allocation and eight was non-allocated. Has there been identified use of those? Are the current properties using those and will they lose parking spaces which will add to the number of um, parking bays on the street that will be required yeah the 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 uh, the, the the six the six bays which are are, are all the bays are non-allocated so the residents don't have a right to park on site but to determine the potential overspill of the development and the loss of the, those informal parking spaces, uh, we looked at now the, which is quite old, the 2011 parking census for the car ownership to determine what those eight dwellings potentially could own car-wise. And based on a robust assessment of five vehicles, these were then added to the um, or taken away from the parking availability that the parking survey showed. So they could be supported, those additional five vehicles could be supported in the, the daytime, which has 23 spaces in the vicinity of the development. Okay, thank you, um, Mr Keating. Are, are there any more questions from the committee? Councillor Bevan. Yeah, uh, three questions. You talk about the fire systems on page 36. It talks about various evacuation lifts and suppression systems. There seems to be different fire protections for the various blocks. Can you just clarify each block exactly what fire protection system they've got and the lifts? So that's my, and I'm assuming they've all been approved by the fire brigade. That's my first uh, question. The second question is, with this new way of living with passive house and heat pumps and all that type of thing, it's good industry practice now, after people have lived in these properties for say six months, you do a survey to pick up any problems that you can avoid in future. I wonder if you would accept a condition in this application that a survey of all the residents would be done after an appropriate period of time, which I would hope you would do for all your council schemes. And then my last question is, the nine blocks that are being sold privately, I'm not quite sure what tenure they're going to be. I'm concerned that if they were sold freehold, they would not contribute to the maintenance of the, of the, the estate roads and greenery and all that type of thing, because that's what's happened on our council estates when we've sold freehold properties. So I'm not quite sure how that issue has been addressed. Sorry, I'll, I'll come back to you, Councillor, uh, regarding the fire. So, um, sorry, you. sorry. Um, I'll come back to you regarding the fire and then hand over to colleagues um, to deal with the other two points. Um, we have met both Fire Brigade, we have a fire consultant who's submitted a, a very clear fire statement. Um, and also we've had uh, uh, detailed conversations with Building Control regarding the fire strategy, which they are very happy with. Uh, sorry. sorry, sorry about that. Um, on the post could you introduce? Could you just introduce yourself? I, so, sorry, Robbie Erdman. I'm the assistant director for housing at the council. 
Um, on the post occupancy surveys, that's part of our standard procedures for every every site that we bring forward and part of our gateway procedures. So we'll commit to that as we do, in fact, commit on every scheme. Um, in, ter in terms of the private properties, there's obviously a changing legislative landscape on leasehold. Um, so it's something it's something that we'll need to look very carefully at. You know, there is legislation coming to the House of Commons on leasehold at the moment. The government have previously stated their intention not to allow um, lease leasehold leasehold houses. So we'll obviously have to keep. We will. We'll always seek to you know seek to get the maximum contribution that we can to the immunity space. We'll have to look very carefully at what the legislative landscape looks like when we're looking to set, sell the homes. Okay. And Chair, if I may just um, come in with a um, point of clarification on the energy monitoring on page 47 in um, condition 20, um, point C of that condition um, requires um, after first occupation evidence of the um, performance um, against the energy targets. So that is secured um, in the conditions rec that are recommended. Did you want to come back, Councillor Bevan? Yeah, that's not. I, I accept what you say, but that's not picking up the problems that residents might have living a new way with passive house and all that other type of equipment, which is new to a lot of people. So I want the survey to pick up those type of problems. And I, I got your assurance about if it's freehold, they don't end up paying for the maintenance of the estate. I don't know whether we can strengthen that because it's just an assurance and you know I, I don't know if we can make that a condition or a, a informative so just just from our perspective i think on the on the post occupancy survey and the experience of residents would be more than happy for the count you know for for uh, for planning to condition that as as you know as part of as part of our application with with the point around whether we'd be able to whether we'd be able to do freehold or leasehold, I think that that feels more like a legislative point. We'll do our best in the legislative environment that we're in, um, but it may well not it may well not be possible for us very shortly to to sell leasehold houses, um, which would which would obviously limit our 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 ability to recharge recharge for the immunity space. Chair, yes, um, and happy to incorporate Councillor Bevan's um, suggestion into the point C. Um, the, the final line of that is um, that the, the measures to monitor that should um, use data from the first year and a brief statement of occupational involvement. Um, I would add just after that to say, including a resident survey to evidence this training and engagement. Thank you, Councillor Say. Yes, I'm coming on to the carbon. Uh, basically, the London plan, it says on page 34, uh, says it should be a carbon zero, and you've got it down to 90% reduction, which is good, but I'd like to know why it isn't zero. Also on 6.179, uh, there's a financial offset. Well, you can't financially offset the end of the planet. I'm sorry. We've got to stop doing this. I'm so sorry, I didn't hear your second point. Would you mind repeating that? Sorry. The second point being, uh, we're paying a financial contribution to offset, not not complying with that 0% carbon. We can't do that to save the planet, can we? We can't pay money to save the planet. Thank you, Councillor. Um, perhaps if I just respond on the, the zero carbon, um, and the fact that we're 90%. The reason for that, um, as I'm sure everyone uh, in this room can appreciate, is that designing a passive house scheme in a, um, in a sensitive site is, is quite complex in terms of actually ensuring that the form of the building is contextual um, and, and also achieves net zero carbon. So, for example, a simpler scheme that achieve, achieve net zero carbon would have a flat roof um, and um, possibly, we believe, not sit contextually within its, within, its, within its setting. Also, a scheme that's higher density um, with taller buildings 
would um, achieve net zero carbon more easily, but those that are smaller, that have a smaller number of homes and a smaller roof space um, uh, to achieve 100% um, uh, net zero carbon is quite, quite diff well, very, very difficult in that, the, in that instance. So um, if you're visiting any net zero carbon schemes, you'll notice that that often they have flat roofs often either they're very high density and they are um, tall with flat roofs um, or they are terraces of houses and it's uh, uh, very difficult to achieve others that have a contextual roof line that deal with um, pvs in a sensitive way for example that also achieve very high levels of biodiversity net gain so you're greening spaces um, uh, rather than using them for other functions. So what we've tried to achieve is the right balance and pushing the most sustainable scheme, but also a scheme that sits well in its context. Um, thank you. Could I bring in Rob Shizos? Thank you, Chair. Um, and just to um, elaborate on that a bit further, Councillor say you're quite right. The policy preference in the development plan is for zero and low carbon on site. Um, but policy in the development plan does also allow for financial contributions to offset that where it cannot be met on site and the applicant team has set out the reasons why that cannot, cannot be fully done on site but there is a, um, a contribution which goes into our community carbon offset fund um, and that is in accordance with development plan policy. Okay, any more questions? Councillor Corley Harrison. Yeah, I'd just like um, further clarity from the, maybe from the applicants or the officers. There was a reference made in the presentation um, regarding potential further development of the terrace houses. So I'm just wondering whether the scheme had those terrace houses been in council ownership, would the scheme be coming forward as that was being presented on screen as if it were to come forward um, in future or, or are we, is that going to be a two-phase scheme and is all the provision there for that to happen as in on the site will there be enough you know outdoor space and, and all of these sorts of things were that to happen uh, did you want yes um just to, to, to clarify the planning position on that um that the site is within a site allocation and that comes with it um, certain responsibilities to, to master plan and, and look ahead. Um, in this case, the applicant team have done that. They, they've um, shown an indicative scheme that um, that we consider to be acceptable um, in, ter in design terms. Um, and really the, the, the obligation is, is to show that this development doesn't fetter that coming forward. So in terms of planning considerations, that's really all members need to consider. And um, our recommendation is, is on the basis that we're satisfied that, that, that that's adequate for that obligation. OK, thank you. Thank you very much. So the recommendation is that we uh, grant. Um, uh, as the vice chair is very helpfully guiding me through this meeting tonight, thank you, Councillor Rice. Um, uh, as I've said, the uh, recommendation is to uh, grant. I think we have had a good debate tonight um, uh, and ha have had all of the clarifications and questions addressed. Can I just pass over to you, Ms. McNaught? Thank, thank you, Chair. Yes. Um, so. As you say, recommendation is to grant, um, as set out in the report um, and the addendum, and also um, with the amendment to condition 20.C that I noted earlier. Okay, so we now move to a vote. Oh, Councillor Corley Harrison. Yeah, I'd like to move to defer, Chair. We were presented with an addendum which questions a significant number of points that are made just an hour before the meeting. Um, we have a live police investigation regarding this site, 
a live court case regarding an LGO investigation regarding this site, an internal investigation regarding this site. And I don't think that it would be appropriate for the council to make a determination before all of those are resolved and concluded and published. And I believe that the LGO report into the site that was published earlier in the year, or perhaps last year, um, there's not been clarification that Haringey has resolved all of the points that were recommended by the LGO on that. So, as I say, on those grounds, I don't think that it would be appropriate for the committee to be making um, a decision on this at this stage. Uh, Chair, if I may, um, I, th I think at this point it would be helpful just to hear from our, our legal officer on this point. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you. Um, the actual um, LGO has actually been resolved, Councillor, and they've closed their case into this. And so it isn't a relevant consideration at this time. I'm sorry. The, um, the LGO have actually closed their investigation and said that it was satisfactory response, and so it's not a relevance to this actual um, consideration this evening. And what about all of the other investigations I just mentioned? I'm not aware of any court actions regarding this site either. I believe there's a live court case regarding the LGO report. Councillor Colin Harrison, can you go through the chair, please? Um, Councillor Bevan, you wanted to come in. Yeah, in the addendum, of which it includes two late responses, one of them is anonymous. In my opinion, anonymous submission should not be accepted. Perhaps the legal officer would like to comment on that, because I would certainly not accept anonymous emails uh, into my box asking uh, various questions. So I would not support a deferral of this decision. Can the legal officer comment on that? Though anonymous um, representations are not normally accepted, there are exceptional circumstances on this occasion, Councillor Bevan, that has been allowed. Okay, so, um, uh, Councillor Corey Harrison made move the motion to defer the matter. I, I, it doesn't appear to me that he has that motion seconded. I'm is just it, about. I'm just about to ask for us to see if there is a seconder, Councillor Rice. So, um, uh, Councillor Corley Harrison has moved to defer. Uh, is there a seconder? No. Okay. So then we move to a vote. So all those in favour, please show. All those in favour to grant um, uh, uh, to grant uh, permission. Subject to the conditions and subject to the conditions set out by Mr. McNaughton. I, this is my first time I'm chairing this meeting, which so I apologise. Um, so let me just do that again. Um, so all those in favour, please show. All those against? Any abstentions? Thank you. Okay, so that's that is resolved. Thank you. Thank you very much.
Right. Can we can we can we can we move on to the next item, please? Which is item nine, um, which is 103 to 107 North Hill, N6, 4DP. Um, the recommendation recommendation for this is to grant the planning officer Valerie Okay is here to talk us through uh, the application. Thank you. Good evening. The proposal is for the demolition of existing buildings and redevelopment to provide a new care home together with the wellbeing and physiotherapy centre providing up to 70 rooms with ancillary facilities, car and cycle parking and associated works. The existing care home is highlighted in red and the site is occupied by a series of interconnected buildings on an L-shaped plot. The existing buildings on site have two frontages facing onto North Hill and onto View Road. The site is located within the Highgate Conservation Area and to the north are the adjacent row of Grade 2 listed buildings fronting North Hill, which is highlighted in blue. The existing buildings on the site have two frontages facing onto North Hill. Sorry, to the south are the locally listed buildings fronting View Road highlighted in red. This is a series of aerial views of the site. Immediately north of the site, which is highlighted in red, is a narrow strip of land owned by the council, which falls outside the application site boundary. Beyond this are the rear gardens of the properties fronting Yatesman Road. To the south is Waverley Court and 1A View Road. And you can see that the site is well screened by trees. This is the front of the site from View Road and the adjacent locally listed house. And this is the front of the site from North Hill and the adjacent listed Georgian Terrace. The site, this slide shows a number of photographs of the existing building on the site. There are a series of extensions to the care home. This is the front garden of the building, front and view road, and this is the garden to the rear. The, these are also some photos. This is the 1960s building and main entrance front in North Hill and the building has been vacant since 2021 when the care home closed. The proposal includes a new modern care home facility together with a wellbeing and physiotherapy centre, 70 bedrooms, landscape and retention of significant trees, new tree planting, car parking, cycle parking, disabled parking bay, electric car charging points, private communal amenity space provision, and more sustainable and any an energy efficient building. The considerations for the scheme are as follows. Principle of the development, quality of accommodation, the character and appearance of the conservation area, high quality design, appropriate scale, high quality landscaping scheme, retention of new um, trees and new tree planting. The proposals would have no material adverse impact on the neighbouring properties and it promotes sustainable travel and it meets the energy and sustainability requirements. I will now focus on one of the key issues. In terms of the principle of the development, traditional long-term senior care meets the requirements of policy DM15 to provide an adequate replacement 
which is 70 per bedrooms proposed with 43 bedrooms being replaced. A wellbeing and physiotherapy centre meets the requirements of policy DM15, meeting an established local need and providing a standard of housing and facilities suitable for the intended occupiers. That's 39% of the 70 bedrooms proposed. And the proposal also meets the requirements set out in the current housing strategy, as it will provide a more modern senior care home, which is needs based. The proposed development is laid out over four floors, and I will look into each floor separately. This is the proposed basement plan, which accommodates 17 car parking spaces and cycle storage space. And the basement also accommodates the physiotherapy centre and other ancillary and servicing facilities. This is the ground floor plan. The bedrooms are highlighted in light green on this floor and will provide convalescent short stay guest accommodation. And the resident facilities are in yellow and staff rooms highlighted in purple. Each bedroom has its own ensuite bathroom with views to the rear and front gardens. The residence facility also has views onto the landscaped areas. And the gray shade to the left shows a vehicle access via a ramp into the basement car park from View Road. And the primary access to the care home will be from View Road. And the North Hill frontage will provide pedestrian access to the wellbeing and physiotherapy centre. And the entrance to the Wellbeing and Physiotherapy Centre is from North Hill and the entrance for servicing is from North Road. It's sorry, from View Road. This slide shows the proposed first, second and third floor plan. The first floor plan will be dedicated to older people's care. The second floor plan will be dedicated to dementia care. Both floors will include day space. The third floor is dedicated to the wellbeing centre only and provides convalescent state accommodation. The quality and layout of the proposed accommodation is considered to be suitable for the intended occupiers in line with the requirements of policy DM15. This slide is the landscape master plan, which shows the existing trees to be retained alongside new tree planting and different types of vegetation alongside other landscape features. This is the urban greening factor comparison plan. The plan to the left is existing and the plan to the right is proposed. The urban greening factor can be higher even though the landscape space has been reduced <laughs> as the lawn in this instance is replaced with a larger number of plant species which increases biodiversity. This is the proposed tree plan, which includes the planting of eight new trees, which replaces the seven trees that are of low quality. The new trees are highlighted in green. And the existing trees to be retained is highlighted in an orange and blue. The trees will also provide screening. This slide shows the setback distance plan with the existing building outlined highlighted in red. This slide shows the 20 to 30 metre distance between the main rear wall of the properties on Yateman Road and that of the proposal. It is important to note that the site itself and many of its neighbours are densely landscaped with existing trees to be retained and additional trees, which also helps to reduce loss of privacy and overlooking. The proposal broadly returns, follows the form and footprint of the existing building, with the proposed building line pulled away from boundaries to neighbouring properties. And the proposal also meets breed daylight and sunlight guidance. This slide shows the proposed elevation and existing building outlined in red. This slide also shows the proposed elevation and existing building outlined in red. In terms of the impact of the proposal on the conservation area, the proposal enhances the quality of the area. 
The proposal front in North Hill fully respects the listed terrace and its urban context. The proposal front in View Road respects the height of neighbouring houses. The proposal is of high quality, a high quality design of an appropriate scale to its context and respects the visual amenity of the streetscape and locality generally and is supported by the conservation team. This slide shows the existing and proposed building on the View Road frontage, which respects the height of the neighbouring houses and has been designed as a contemporary reinterpretation of a suburban villa. This slide shows the existing and proposed buildings on the North Hill frontage. The proposed building reflects the proportions of the existing one and is a significant improvement. And it fully respects the listed Georgian terrace to the right. This slide is a view of the proposed building along North Hill. You can see the listed terrace. This is the view of the proposed building along View Road. This building will be predominantly faced in red multi and contrasting dark red brick and include a dark grey slate pitched roof. This is a view of the proposed building along North Hill towards the listed Georgian Terrace. This building will be predominantly faced in a yellow buff brick the scheme has been through extensive pre-application discussions with officers. In addition, in addition to feedback from local groups and the quality review panel on two occasions. This is the section 106 head of terms. Accordingly, the proposal is recommended for approval. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Um, so do we have any uh, clarification questions from the committee, please? So, um, Councillor Bartlett. Thanks. Can I just clarify what, which, um, which part of the development is the main access for cars? Is it View Road or, or um, North Hill? It's from View Road, not North Hill, View Road. Councillor White. Thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, and I've got a question on the uh, principle of development and uh, the, um, the claimed um, accordance of this development with uh, policy DM15. So I'm, I'm actually um, looking at page 281 in the pack which is about the uh, the pre-application briefing uh, where it's noted that uh, it was raised uh, that there are going to be that, that, that the the planned uh, use of the site is a different uh, kind of specialist housing than um, uh, uh, the existing use the existing use being a uh, uh, long-term re residential care home and the, the, the new plan is for short term stays after hospital treatment. So um, what I'd like to know is uh, what assessment has been done of the need uh, for those different types of specialist uh, housing and uh, what was the outcome of those assessments? And are we still confident after that that this um, accords with uh, uh, DM15. So the applicant stated that they had commissioned experts to assess the demand for care homes provisions in the local area and concluded that there is a pr good provision of traditional care homes within the area for older people. However, they identified a strong demand for nursing and convalescent home to assist older people to recuperate from operations and increase their health span. Thanks. Councillor Corley Harrison. <clears throat> well, two points. One was very similar to uh, Councillor White, so it's not a care home. 
Yes, it is a care home with a very small element that relates to the um, recuperation, convalescent. All oh, right, so different to the yeah. pre-op. Um, in the um, pack and what was on screen was a very different design to the CGIs that were on the application that I saw as the latest designs, where, for example, North Hill, the, uh, the frontage is sort of tiered step back. One was one colour, then there was a white one, then there was a, a red one. So I don't understand what the latest design is now, because that looked like it was the latest design, and we're seeing something different here. Right, so the elevation in North Hill was revised. Um, so initially it had three different materials. Well, it proposed two brick and render. So that was three different um, facades and um, material on the facade. But now it's just a single brick, a yellow buff brick. And we went out to consultation following this. Sorry, through you, Chair. Is there, could you direct me to that on the application page, someone, if you wouldn't mind? Just because the resolution on the in the pack is very, very low, you see. So on page 262, it says proposed North Hill frontage, and you'll see that the proposed frontage, which is the amended frontage, is a single yellow buff brick. Yeah, sorry, again, through you, Chair. It was on the application web page that I'm referring to. Sorry, if you look at the amendments dated 05, yeah, 5th of March 2022, you will see the um, single buff brick on the North Hill elevation. So if you look at proposed elevation um, on, yeah. So you've got a list of documents that were submitted. So you had um, updated design and access statement to reflect the um, elevation that was amended. Yeah, Councillor, if we can, we could we could share that on the screen if that's helpful. Um, And do you mind, Councillor, if we come back to that, and I can just see if there are any other questions or clarifications from the committee, Councillor Bevan? Well, it's it's on that word yellow, because in these papers it does say yellow, which I think would be awful. But when you saw the picture on the screen, it was not yellow; it was a a sort of paley reddish. So. I wouldn't like the developer to get this permission, see the words yellow in there and start putting yellow bricks because that would really spoil the whole scheme. Um, Councillor, I think we have the image almost ready. It's probably worth going to Richard, our design officer, just to um, explain um, what he, his expectation is of, of what that brick will be. Yes, I, I said exactly the same. I, I would call this buff, not yellow. I mean, I don't think it's going to be a bright yellow in any way. It's clearly designed uh, in those images to match the colour of the existing Georgian houses. And I think that would be the, any expectation that, that, that we will. We will obviously secure the material by condition, but it's clear that the material will have to comply with the elevations that, should you choose to approve this, uh, will have been approved, which will be um, elevations that show the brick matching the colour of the existing terrace house next door, which I would call buff, not yellow, but the applicants chose to call yellow. So, but it'll all be down to condition. Thank you. So, uh, oh, how are we doing? 
The chair, if I might just at this point suggest an informative, perhaps, um, could be a way to deal with that to um, to make it clear that um, uh, it's a, a buff brick um, that, that it should be accepted as part of that condition um, rather than a yellow brick. Thank you. So are there any any more questions? Yeah. Councillor Rice. Yeah, can I, can I ask why they're taking out the trees? I can't see any need to take trees out from this development. The trees have to just uh, to, to, to hinder overlooking. And, you know, I'm not sure why the premises being knocked down anywhere, but I'll ask that when the developers come on, because I, I quite like the current premises, particularly from the garden, but who's me? <laughs> Can you just, so your question was about the trees? My question is why are you taking the trees out and why are you knocking the, the, the current building down? Because I can't see anything wrong with it. We're just um, sharing a plan of that at the moment, just in terms of the um, the the trees and the constraints in the site. Um, sorry, councillor. Um, on screen, there's now a, a, the um, tree plan, just explaining um, the constraints around the trees. Valerie, if, if there's anything you wanted to add, um, otherwise, you know, in, in terms of the, the justification for those, um, that's ultimately a question for the for the applicant in, in terms of how they constrain the design and things like that. But in terms of um, why we find them acceptable, um, Valerie can can clarify that. So the tree officer has assessed the scheme and he is happy that the trees to be, that are being removed, which are seven trees, are of low quality value and they will be replaced with eight new trees. As well as a number of existing trees will be retained. And it's shown on this plan. So the blue and orange shows the existing trees to be retained and you've got the green, which shows the new trees to be planted. So there's eight new trees to be planted. Is that green at the back of the garden or the front? So there's new trees proposed to the front. Um, there's one to the there's one to the rear over here, so next to the garden which is the rear garden, and there's new trees proposed to the front. So, yeah, so mainly to the front, but also, yeah, there's a tree proposed to the rear and to, to the front, um, to the North Hill frontage. Okay, thank you. Councillor Bevan. Yeah, I'm not sure if the developer's going to speak, so I'll raise this point now. When we had an extra care scheme in Tottenham, next to the Sixth Form College, the scheme gave a commitment to provide work experience to some of the college students. The employment initiatives here are quite weak. I wonder if we could strengthen them, say that they offer, say for five years, work experience to the uh, colleges nearby or, or something along those lines? Yes, councillor, um, that is, is a, a good point and would be in line with um, our guidance. Um, I think we, we could be more explicit on um, on what those um, should involve. Um, and perhaps once we've heard from the applicant, um, if there's a, if they, they could ex explain what they'd be um, expecting to offer in that regard, um, and then we can um, draft something additional in the heads of terms in that respect. Thank you. Okay, all right, so we'll move on now to the objectors. I think we have three objectors, yes? Do we? Yes. Do you want to come forward? And uh, you have um, Three minutes, if you want to come and sit at this table there, sir. Yeah. 
and if you would kindly introduce yourself. And as I say, you have three minutes. That's on, is it? Um, can you put your microphone on? And I'll just remind you, it's three minutes each. Good evening. My name is Aurel Taussig. I live right next door to the site at 109 North Hill. My house is Grade 2 listed, part of a listed Georgian terrace. This development will be devastating for my property. The part of the new building which will run alongside my back garden will be much larger, bulkier and higher than it is currently. The very tall North Hill block will be far deeper, extending further down the side of my garden, and the block linking it to other buildings on the site will be much higher. I have a picture here showing the impact. This will reduce the sunlight in my garden by more than 50%, according to the developer's own submissions. This is a massive breach of the re relevant guidelines on sunlight, which say a new development can take away no more than 20% of a neighbor's sunlight. Only one fifth of my garden will have sun. My windows will have much less light. I will feel enclosed by very high walls and with much less view of the sky. Also, the part of the building that juts out at the bottom of my garden will be built closer to me than currently, increasing the sense of enclosure. Houses on Yateman Road will also lose sunlight in breach of the guidelines. The planning officer has dismissed my concerns, saying the current building and trees in my garden already overshadow me, and the same goes for Yateman Road. But she is not applying the guidelines and the council's policies correctly, which say trees should be ignored. And it doesn't matter how overshadowed you are to start with, what matters is the impact of the new development on the light one does have. I submitted an objection last week making this point and asked the planning officer to address it in her addendum, but I see she has not mentioned it at all. Also, the building will have new windows overlooking my garden and the Yateman Road gardens. We will be looking at massive, extremely high brick walls which will invade our privacy. This will have an overbearing and dominant presence. Finally, the basement. This will be enormous. My house is fragile. It's Georgian and has no foundations. This excavation risks causing serious damage to my house and others in the terrace. The basement impact assessment says that ground movements during the works will cause cracking to my property, estimated at almost level two in the relevant scale, which a structural engineer has advised me would generally not be acceptable. There is also flood risk. My structural engineer tells me they have not dug the right type or number of boreholes and not tested the site over the wetter winter months. The area has complex hydrology and other nearby basement excavations have caused flooding to neighbors. This is very dangerous. Overall, this building will be grossly out of scale with its neighbours and breaches local conservation area policies. It will destroy my amenity and may cause structural damage. I'm amazed the conservation officer has approved it, as it will cause neighbouring properties, including listed buildings, so much harm. The proposals must be refused and the plans amended. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Tossig. So the next, um, the next objector, please. Could you introduce yourself? And you have three minutes. Oh yes, we 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 do have them. I think we just we just uploaded them or downloaded them or whatever. Thank you. All right. So over to you, sir, and you have three minutes. Put your microphone oh, on. And make sure you speak into the microphone. <laughs> Start again. I'm, I'm David Richmond, a multi-award winning architect with over 40 years experience, and I'm speaking in opposition to this proposal on behalf of the Highgate Society and the Highgate Conservation Area Advisory Committee. You have just heard from the immediate neighbour describing the appalling impact of this proposal on their home and on their lives. To help illustrate this point, I've taken a photograph in their rear garden on the left and accurately superimposed the applicant's own drawing and you can see the effect on the right there. I do not know how many of the committee members have back gardens but the, can they please ask themselves under what circumstances their own neighbours might get permission for a four-storey high rear extension and a two-storey extension the full length of the garden. 
it should be unthinkable in any circumstances, let alone in a conservation area where the affected property is grade two listed and its setting supposedly protected by the local authority. It is not just the effect on the listed terrace, but also the effect on the council built and owned housing estate immediately down the hill from this proposal. Is it possible to switch to the next image, please? Here is a section through the site which shows Yateman Road council houses at the right and towering above them the new proposal, which is a full story height higher than the existing buildings and closer to the boundary where the courtyard used to be. This impacts on their sunlight and over overlooks them. Uh, by the way, ignore that red line, it is a deception, but please ask me why afterwards. Is it right that a private commercial development with little discernible public benefit should impact so badly on both a listed terrace and on one of your own council-owned estates? That is for you to decide. We are not opposed to the redevelopment of this site, but this proposal is nearly three times the size of the existing scheme. We believe that it only needs, only, only a small percentage of this vast increase were to be removed, then a far more acceptable scheme could be achieved. Why does the North Hill block need to be made so much deeper that it overshadows the listed houses next door, seriously harming their setting? Why does the link block to the North Hill building need to have a second floor added when the existing ground floor link would be perfectly adequate? Why does the basement need to extend under the North Hill block at all, putting the listed houses at serious risk of harm or collapse? Why does the North Hill block need to have a top floor when, as can be seen in this image, um, it could make a positive contribution to the conservation area? Mr Richmond, your, your three minutes is up. One, one final sentence, please. These limited changes would still leave the scheme well over twice as big as the existing. Is that not enough? We respectfully suggest that these changes must be introduced before it can be approved. If that means a refusal rather than a deferment now, then so be it. Thank you. And if you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer them. Thank you. Um, so we move on to uh, Mr. Shearman. I've got um, an image I've spoken to. Uh, the lady, if I could just, I did something. I've circled the new windows. <laughs> Is that one? Okay, well, you should have submitted it before, but I will allow it to be passed round. Okay, thank you. So you have three minutes, so uh, if you can introduce yourself. Good evening, my name is David Scheinman. Uh, I live at 1A View Road, uh, which is immediately next door and to the rear of the application site. I'm here to ask you to reject the application in its current form. The planning officer refers in her committee report to 43 responses from neighbours to the application. Please note that not one of these uh, responses was in favour of the application and 40 were positively against it. I'm the chief executive of a PLC regional house builder and an experienced developer myself, and I would be supportive of a new proportionate scheme that, pre that preserves my privacy and amenity. Currently, it does not do so. On page 143 of this report, Two of the nine key reasons for the, plan for the planning officer's recommendations are that there'd be no significant adverse impact on the surrounding highway network and that the impact of the development on resident immunity is acceptable. Both of these statements are incorrect and there's nothing in the applicant's submission or the planning, planning officer's report that supports these statements. 
The applicant's highways report shows the additional traffic generated by the, by the increased scheme that does nothing to show the impact of the extra cars on the surrounding highway network. In effect, the proposal will render parts of View Road to be a single file due to the requirement to use the residents' parking bays on both sides of the road for the spillover from the uh, development. This will inevitably cause huge traffic jams on North Hill, and it will cause inevitable danger to the dozens of school kids that use the crossing in the morning and at the end of the day, and it needs to be assessed before the, applicant, before the ap application can be considered. This is so fundamental and important that the, the application should be re rejected on its own, uh, or just on this point. I don't have time to say more on this point, but please ask me afterwards if uh, you have any questions. Regarding my amenity and privacy, the relevant policy um, states that development proposal must ensure a high standard of privacy and amenity for the neighbours, and that the council will support a proposal that provides an appropriate amount of privacy to their residents and neighbouring properties to avoid overlooking and loss of privacy that's detrimental to the amenity of the neighbouring residents. Planning, planning officer's report states that the impact on neighbours' amenity is a material consideration. She further states, um, under the heading of impact on neighbours' amenity, that specifically proposals are required to provide an appropriate amount of privacy to neighbouring properties to avoid overlooking and loss of privacy and detriment to the amenity of neighbouring residents. I do not believe that my amenity has been properly considered. I do not believe that the proposals have been provided to avoid overlooking and the loss of privacy, which is to my detriment. The proposal seeks to create 10 new bedrooms and bedroom windows, which I've shown, which has shown eight of them there. There's two outside of the print, which will um, which will be either 12 and a half metres for my main living room or 13 and a half metres for my dining room. All but one of these will have windows that do not currently exist looking into my garden and my main living room. I provided the planning officer with a list of councils who require minimum window to window distances in facing habitable rooms. Almost without exception, the minimum required distance is 21 metres to Thank avoid you. overlooking. I have 12 and a half metres, not 21 metres, and it's not acceptable. I put to you this uh, unacceptable loss of privacy. I, uh, uh, one, 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 I'm one being word. very lenient. Uh, scheme, but, just please, please. On, a reduced proposal to perhaps 55 or 60 rooms instead of 70 is the sensible way to protect my privacy and immunity and to lessen the impact on the surrounding highway network to acceptable levels. Please refuse this application. Thank you. Um, okay, so I'm going to go to um, clarification questions from the committee, please. Councillor Rice, sorry, what do you want? Yeah, uh, thanks. The objector talks about reduction in light in his premises, but where's the documentation to support that? I see no light study that can assist me in coming to, 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 to a, a balanced view. And then you, you also talk about cracking of your, the walls in your premises. Again, I see no report from anyone with any authority giving advice to the committee about crack, the cracking which occurs in your property. And there's also, there's some talk about a grade two listing. I don't understand that. I mean, how could this be a grade two listing and being knocked down? Uh, let me answer those questions point by point. The developers submitted a daylight and sunlight report, which is on the Haringey website. I've looked at the, the, the figures that I quoted are taken directly from that report. It's called DPR Daylight and Sunlight Report. And in that report, it's, it says there's something called the sun on ground test, which is part of the BRE guidelines, which deal with what is acceptable to take away uh, daylight and sunlight from neighbours. The sun on ground test, they said that they tested 12 properties um, on North Hill and Yateman Road, of which three failed the sun on ground test under the BRE guidelines, mine by an enormous margin. Three more barely scraped through, and the other six were not badly affected. So half of those which they tested failed or very close to failed. There were other um, daylight studies done in that in that report, and you'll see a reference to 98 or 99 percent of neighbouring properties' windows being unaffected. Those are dealing with different daylight tests under the BRE guidelines. That 98 percent figure is highly misleading because in arriving at that, they've looked at 117 windows, which includes 59 windows from the Highcroft 
property, which is the other side of North Hill, far too far away to be at all relevant. So that's a very misleading figure, which the planning officer, with all due respect, has accepted uncritically in her report. So that's the first one. There is a daylight and sunlight report submitted by the developers, which is on the Haringey website. I read that. That's I've taken their own uh, conclusions and cited those. On the cracking, there is a basement impact assessment, which again the developers submitted, and that one I, I've taken. What I've taken on that is comes from that report. That says that my property, which is directly next door to the to the site, um, is very likely going to going to suffer cracking. There's a, a scale called the Borland scale, which um, assesses the, the, the severity of the cracking. They say that I will be level one, but very close to the boundary with level two, uh, where and my advice that I've, I've got from a structural engineer who knows the uh, area very well. He's commented on other proposals in the neighboring vicinity. He tells me anything at level two would generally not be acceptable. So again, that is in the basement impact assessment, which is on the website, submitted by the developers themselves. I haven't just come out of that from nowhere. That's their own uh, their own submission. And then the third point you mentioned, forgive me, what was the third point? Oh yes, about the grade two listed. The building which is being knocked down is not listed. The grade two listed buildings are my property and the rest of the terrace, which is right next door to the care home. So what we're talking about is they want to demolish a building um, and, but, just a few meters away is my property. I'm the end of terrace, and it's grade two listed, built in 1811, has no foundations. They want to build an enormous basement, um, which will cause, you know, the excavation of that will cause an awful lot of structural damage, an awful lot of damage. And, you know, the, the, the basement impact assessment talks about uh, the likely uh, cracking to my, to my property, and it, it could be much worse, it's just an estimate at the moment that they've got there. But the point about listed buildings is important because the council has policies which say that listed buildings need to, the setting of listed buildings needs to be preserved. It's policy DM9 in the development management plan. And um, I find it absolutely extraordinary that the conservation officer and the planning officer seem to think that it's acceptable for such an enormous demolition work, an enormous um, building to be to be built so much bigger than what's there currently, right next to a to a grade two listed building, um, which is of great significance. And the the the, the, the developers okay, in their you. basement impact has already or talk about. I think that you've themselves. covered the points. Thank you. Any more questions from the committee? Yes, yeah, Chair, can I ask, is the um, conservation officer at this meeting to pick up the points that have been just made? Which person, sorry? The conservation officer. Yeah. Yes, um, Chair, if I could come in on that. We do have a conservation officer available um, who could perhaps um, clarify what has been assessed in terms of the setting of the list of buildings. Hello, <clears throat> may I talk? Yes, please. Hi, so um, I'm Katarina Kukuzaki, Senior Conservation Officer. Um, so about um, this project has been um, discussed ex extensively at pre-obligation discussions with the design and conservation team. About the list there, all of the heritage assets have been considered, the conservation area, the listed building, the locally listed buildings in the vicinity of the site. Um, the existing building uh, along um, North Hill um, has um, a um, lift shaft, which is the tallest element of this part of the building, and is closest to the listed um, terrace. And it has been readjusted. The height um, of the new build of the new element across North Hill has been reduced closer to the terraces. It has been set back, and it has um, been very slightly increased further from the listed terraces. Overall, the the, the proportions and the, the scale and um, hasn't changed significantly can, can, hasn't changed significantly it has just been readjusted that has been seen on the plans so from a conservation perspective we do think that the north hill elevation um, improves the townscape and it takes um and, and improves the setting of the cottages of the terraces because it takes away um the extra height and and removed it and readjust it more properly. So that is what um, we believe from conservation perspective. The the basement and the amenity issues, all this need to be assessed, of course, but it's not for us conservation team to assess them. Uh, thank you, Councillor Corley Harrison. 
Thanks. Um, one of the applicants presented an image on screen um, of uh, 109, I think it was, uh, the garden view with a window overlooking. Um, so I'd be interested in knowing what the function of that window was. And then another of the um, objectors presented a, a sheet with a number of other windows being circulated. So I'd also be interested in understanding what those windows, what the function of those windows were, whether they were corridors, stairwells, bedrooms, for example. Councillor, we'll, we'll just um, bring up one of the plans from the presentation earlier to um, to show you that. Just while colleagues are bringing that up, I can just add a bit on some of the um, basement issues. So um, for committee's benefit, if they're not spotted already, there's two conditions um, about basement development um, in the in the report recommended for you today. Um, and then uh, paragraph 6.8.5 and 6.8.6 .6 talk about the basement issues. Um, and whilst um, some issues about the basement can be determined at this stage, in terms of planning, some issues cannot in terms of structural works and party walls and um, a construction management plan is recommended to be conditioned. Um, so some of those issues are addressed in that um, and other legislation does deal with um, the structural integrity of proposed basement works um, and planning cannot always duplicate those. Um, so things like building regulations are separate to planning regulations and any proposal would need the relevant building control approvals as well. Um, at this stage, nevertheless, to, to be sure, um, we can recommend this for approval today. Um, building control colleagues were um, consulted and there was no objection um, from building control colleagues at this stage, although it's still subject to the detailed building control approvals as would be expected. So there's quite a bit already in the report on basement to help address some of the concerns raised. Thank you. Um, so I just want to go back to the... Um, uh, to the plan that's been brought up can we can we just answer councillor corley harrison's question on that and then i will bring in the other councillors sorry can you repeat the question please thank you yeah you presented sorry one of the objectives presented an image on the screen that showed a window overlooking their rear garden so i'm wondering what the function of the room that the window was from was and then there was a sheet also handed around with a number of windows on um, a separate rear garden so i would like to know what the function of those windows were right so the windows that face onto the rear garden of north hill are hallway windows which you can see along here and then the windows that face onto one av road um david mr david sherman he spoke and their bedroom windows this is at first floor and then you go to the second floor and you can see that there's no f additional floor here. It's a flat roof. The pink is a day space. So it's a day space for the... Um, uh, oh, this... Are you talking about this? But. That's a terrace. Um, it's an enclosed terrace. Councillor Say. Sorry, can I can I clarify a point? Because there's a point that's not exactly complete there. If that's okay, um, they are all habitable rooms, and there there are ten new windows overlooking my garden. At the moment, there is one window, which is a, a utility room, but it's a clear window. So there will be n although. Um, it's not all new space, there is an existing wall. There will be new windows 
um, five new windows in the existing building, uh, which will be overlooking me directly, and there's no way to screen it, and you can't use obscure glass in habitable rooms as a solution. Thank you. Councillor Say. Yeah, the uh, quality review panel, um, uh, one of its suggestions was to retain the existing 1960s, what they call brutalist North Hill block on grounds of embodied carbon, but officers uh, uh, have always been supportive of its replacement on grounds of its rather ugly architecture, currently being a detractor from the conservation area in the immediate context of a listed Georgian terrace, but it sounds like the listed Georgian terrace would rather like it to stay there. So do you, do you want to comment on that, please? The applicants had explored options of retaining the existing building, but it could not be adequately adapted to provide a modern care facility. Councillor Buxton. Thank you. Uh, it was just a uh, point of clarity from what uh, Rob said. So um, uh, if I'm right, we don't know the full extent of uh, the potential damage that could be done to the neighbouring properties in the demolition and basement excavation, but there is potential uh, for that to be reassessed down the line. And if so, uh, what happens to those um, uh, to, to that in that case? Thank you, Councillor. Yes, um, I, I mentioned the conditions in there, so it would be subject to further approval, looking at that in more detail on the conditions and also building control approval. And did Mr McNocko, uh, would you like to say something further on the conditions? Yes, I think um, just... Um, Sorry. Sorry, I just wanted to say something quickly, but the applicants have also confirmed that they will be using our council's building control officers to inspect the basement development. And just as I was going to say, um, <clears throat> I think um, in light of some of the points raised, um, condition 26 is um, the condition that deals with um, the monitoring of the construction work during um, basement works that um, could really be enhanced by um, an additional condition, um, which would ask for the submission of a design of the basement, um, looking at um, some of the issues that have been raised, groundwater, um, I, and, the, and the sort of natural flow of that, um, and seeking to, to ensure that the design um, from a starting point um, can achieve a Berlin one impact. Um, it's not absolutely guaranteed that that will happen, but um, the design should aim for that, to, to, which is that there's, there's no substantial damage um, or cracking to the, the neighbouring property. Um, so um, we have a, a wording um, that we can um, we could use for that um, as an additional condition, just to address that issue more, more um, substantially. Um, substantially. Thank you. So if we can now move on to the applicant. Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much for your um, submissions. We can move on to the applicant. What? Are you the applicant, councillor? <laughs> so can I have the Sorry? So supporters first, so supporter first, and then the applicant. So the supporter? Pardon? Yeah, no, but I think... Apologies, gonna... Chair, I think that's um, my error. I thought Councillor Emery was just speaking on the one application, uh, not both. So, uh, yeah, it would be him next if oh, he's speaking in objection. Sorry, Councillor Emery. You, you're not on my... You weren't on my list, I'm afraid, but um, go on. Uh, <laughs> apologies. <laughs> Thank you for that, Chair. Good evening. Um, for clarification, my name is Scott Emery. I'm one of the councillors in Highgate. Um, Prior and since being elected, I've had numerous conversations with residents regarding this development, and frankly, I'm a little shocked to see it come to this committee, considering the very varied, uh, very varied selection of objections that are seen against it. We're here tonight not only from many well-argued points of view, but expert analysis from people with trained professional skills. 
We should take note of what has been said here and let it frame how we vote on this matter. This is a conservation area, and this means we should look to preserve the character and feel of the place of the bill and the buildings within it. As has already been mentioned tonight, many residents have concerns of the size of development. It is significantly, significantly bigger than the current building, by some metrics three times as big. Can we say that we're preserving the area's character if we are continuing with this development? Residents from both North Hill and Yeatman Road have spoken out over their fears of the imposing nature of the structure, as well as the loss of the light to their properties. The daylight and sunlight report submitted with this application assesses loss of light to 23 neighboring properties. On some of these properties, there is significant loss to the extent that it fails to meet guidelines entirely. What is the point of these guidelines being in place if we are completely to disregard, disregard them? The issue surrounding the basement is an important one to get right. It is unusual that the basement, the basement impact assessment was not included with the original application and many questions have been raised following its very recent release. These questions have also come from associate and Alan, at Alan Baxter, again, someone with, with expertise in the field. Mr. Coombs has questioned the disturbances on the groundwater flow and whether sufficient boreholes were dug to test the area. If structural damage is caused to nearby properties, the effects on those residents, as well as Harringay Council finances, would be extreme. This development has the feeling of being rushed and many important details being obfuscated, especially surrounding the use of illustrative draw drawings. This has left residents feeling as, the, as though they are being ignored and mistreated. I believe this development fails on several grounds and should be rejected by this committee. Please consider the voices of these residents who appear tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Emery. So, do you want uh, any question? Do you want to stay? Any questions? Well, any questions from the committee to Councillor? Can I just have so, one Councillor question? Rice. Like the, the speaker who just spoke allegedly says, allegedly he says, this is a conservation area. Earlier on in the piece, I ha we had clear advice that this development was just outside the conservation area. Which is it? Is that a question for me? Yeah. yeah. Well, obviously the conservation area includes the things that you can see from the conservation area. So it obviously affects that area there. In the conservation area, or isn't it? Yes or no? I'm being told around me that the answer might be yes anyway. Right, thank you. OK, are there any more questions? No? OK, so we will now move on to the applicant. applicants. Is that? Applicants, please come forward. Right, you have 12 minutes if you want to use that, if you could introduce yourselves um, before you speak. So you have up to 12 minutes. Thank you. Hello. Hi, good evening, councillors. My name is Mitesh Danak, and I'm proud to be putting these proposals to you tonight on behalf of Highgate Care. By way of background, I have been in the care sector for over 25 years, operating a number of successful and award-winning care homes and supported living schemes around the UK, and I employ over 1,120 people. I'm proud to say we have been operating in Herringay since 2008. We operate Priscilla Wakefield House, a 117-bedded nursing home in Tottenham. I understand there may be a level of regret at the loss of the Merrifield and Guild, but as many members will be aware, this was a care home in dire financial difficulty with facilities well below the standard that should be expected for vulnerable older people in the modern age. The Guild chose to sell the site for exactly this reason. They simply could not afford to keep the home open and it was caring for just 16 residents when, when, it, when it closed, despite having 43 bedrooms. Our proposals before you today support 19 new jobs 
retains the care use, which has been on this site for over 100 years, replaces those 43 rooms with spacious and modern ensuite bedrooms in a purpose-built facility, combined with an additional 27 rooms of convalescence care. This is caring for people recovering from surgery, which I'm sure will benefit many people um, when it opens. I wish to add that our original application was for a 70-bedded convalescence unit. However, during consultation, there was a lot of um, uh, 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 demand or uh, need uh, expressed for continuing the uh, care home or long-term care home use. So we've, we've accommodated that use in, in these new proposals. Um, we are grateful to Herringy officers for being so open and collaborative, working with us over the past 18 months to make sure this scheme is the best it can be with very significant design changes along the way. We simply do not accept concerns from the objectors. These are that there are unacceptable impacts on neighboring properties. This is borne out by the fact that your officers and the independent review panel, as well as Historic England, strongly support these proposals, having assessed them thoroughly. I will now hand over to Niraj Dixi, our planning consultant. Thank you. Thank you, Natesh. Good evening, councillors. Beginning with design, we want to be clear that this is a high quality design which takes account of the residential neighbourhood it sits within. Our architects, DWA, are award-winning specialists in care home design and they've brought that expertise to these proposals. A great deal of care and attention has been taken for this building over two, nearly two years of pre-application discussions to be in keeping with its context, working closely with the council's design, heritage and planning officers, as well as the council's independent and impartial QRP, we've put forward a scheme which responds carefully to the conservation area. There are no objections from Historic England and the QRP specifically has offered warm support and commended the tenacity of our scheme for our collaborative approach and called DWA's work to respond to their design comments very positive. Our proposals respect the boundary of the former care home and broadly follow its footprint, including pulling the building line back from sensitive boundaries. We replaced Truscott House adjacent to 109 North Hill, which is identified as a negative feature in the conservation area. Your officers have confirmed the proposals have been carefully shaped with a sensitive, well-founded design approach. Is supported on conservation grounds, has a high quality landscaping scheme which increases the net number of trees on site with a progressive approach in relation to sustainability and renewable energy. We have modest and appropriate height designed to reduce impact on neighbouring properties. And again, your officers have confirmed nearby residential properties would not be materially affected by a potential loss of outlook or privacy. There are very few urban developments in an urban setting which do not have a shadowing impact on at least some neighbouring properties. However, our development performs very well on this front. In terms of daylight and sunlight, our proposal achieves a 98% pass rate against the BRE's vertical skyline component guidelines and a 99% pass rate against the no skyline guidelines. This is an unusually, almost exceptionally good performance for any development in London. In terms of the comments which have been made around our basement impact assessment, we would like to reassure the committee that in addition to the basement impact assessment and the ground conditions and the ground watering monitoring assessment that was taking place, that ongoing assessments made both before and during construction will be undertaken to ensure that the basement works are safe. The Council's own building control experts are clear that we meet and exceed Haringey's policy requirements 
subject to some pre-commencement conditions, which we find perfectly acceptable. More broadly, we have made very significant, excuse me, significant changes to this scheme through our consultation, including the decision to make this predominantly residential care when our initial plans were for a convalescence use only, as there was a clear desire to re-provide residential care on this site. We believe our designs are modest, sensible, and sensitive to its location. We have clearly demonstrated how we've changed both the design and its use through consultation, and the new facilities will bring significant benefits to the area, strongly supported by officers and your independent QRP. I hope councillors can support the scheme this evening, and Matesh and I are happy to take any questions. Thank you. Uh, that's it. Okay, thank you very much. So, um, any supporters? No, okay. So, any questions, um, clarification questions from the committee, please? Councillor Bevan. Yeah, I raised earlier your support for employment and apprenticeships and that type of thing, because as I said, we had an extra care scheme in Tottenham that gave a commitment to the Sixth Form College adjacent to provide work experience on, uh, what shall I say, on a more or less continuous basis. And I note you haven't really got anything here about work experience as such. Is there any way you could improve the opportunities you could give for that type of uh, experience and work to younger people? Not necessarily younger people, could be other people who want to enter that field of employment. Thank you, Councillor Bevan. I think it's quite straightforwardly answered in that we'll be fully supportive of providing those employment training and development opportunities. Um, there is something in amongst the planning documentation that expresses our willingness and uh, encouragement to do so. And officers have actually included a, a Section 106 obligation in the Section 106 agreement that we're happy to accept. And Councillor, if I, I could just clarify, um, based on, on your, your question earlier, um, I would recommend that um, the head of term four on page 146, um, each of the sort of second, third and fourth bullet points just be um, clarified to say um, notify the council of any on-site vacancies during and following construction and then um, that 20 percent of the on-site workforce during and following construction and then five percent of the workforce should be trainees during and following construction. I, I hope that would um, pick up um, what you were seeking to achieve and that would um, clarify what the applicant has already agreed to but wasn't explicit in the heads of terms. Councillor Ovet. Hi, just kind of connected to Councillor Bevan's point. Um, I know there's a minimum threshold of 20%, but given the need for employment, um, especially in these times, just wondering whether that condition or the threshold could be increased um, by any chance? Thank you, Councillor. As you know, following the committee resolution or any committee resolution, at the moment, the officer recommendation is to delegate the precise wording of conditions and Section 106 obligations to officers. So we would be perfectly happy in principle to discuss the wording of that to meet councillors' needs. Uh, Councillor Corley Harrison. Thanks. Um, there's obviously kind of discrepancies, I suppose, between the objectors' views on overlooking privacy and light and the applicants, and also from the submission from, for example, the Highgate Society and from officers. Um, so, for example, on um, page 247, where it refers to um, the concerns about overlooking, I think the officers response is that there are essentially no issues with overlooking and yet we heard uh, and and daylight 
and yet we heard earlier about the loss of over 50 percent of sunlight rather um, not daylight of, of sunlight on, on one property which isn't really referenced so i would like some clarity on the impact on specific properties that have been referenced this evening against um, London plan guidance, our own local guidance, and if um, relevant, obviously the Highgate plan as, as well. Um, I think we have two properties in particular that I'd like to know the distance and the impact. Thank you, Councillor. Um, if I could just bring in our design officer just to provide some more detailed clarification on those points. Thank you. Yes. Um, so we've heard from two um, neighbouring residents and, and, and another objective acting on behalf of those two neighbouring residents. So there's the, 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 the two affected properties. Um, number 109, North Hill, that's the only property with any significant loss of sunlight. There are no properties with any significant loss of daylight. There are, no, there are a couple of properties in Yateman Road with a very minor loss of daylight and sunlight, either to rooms or to their gardens. Um, there are no, the, the, the property in question in uh, North Hill uh, doesn't lose any noticeable amount of daylight or sunlight to any of its rooms, but it does lose quite a significant amount of sunlight to its garden. But that garden is already not BRE compliant. So it's already not receiving the BRE recommended levels of sunlight to, to, to define it as a, as, as, as a, as a well sunlit garden, as the BRE guide puts it. And it would lose about half of the remaining sunlight that it currently gets. Um, but it, as, as, as I say, it would not lose any noticeable amount at all of sunlight to any of its rooms, nor would it lose any noticeable amount of sunlight to any of it, uh, any amount of daylight to any of its rooms. Uh, it would also not lose any significant amount of privacy because although it's, it's, it, there are new windows proposed looking onto it, they're all windows from corridors, and it's proposed that those, win those windows will be in an obscured glass. Um, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, sir. Uh, you wanted to come in, I think. Thank you, Chair. I just really wanted to um, make a point of clarification on Richard's very helpful clarification points. And Richard, mentioned the impact on sunlight to property 109 north hill it's a, it's actually the shadowing of the rear garden it's not sunlight the sunlight and daylight levels to 109 are still within the bre guidelines i hope that helps are there any more questions from the committee well uh, sorry i think you only address one property yes i think um if Valerie's just going to talk through the impact on privacy um, to 1A View Road and has just got a plan um, up to explain that. So if you note the um, setback distance plan, so this is 1A View Road, and you can see the outline of the existing building, which is in red. So you can see that the proposed building has been, even though it goes up a story, it's actually pulled away further from the building, existing building line on all these windows that are facing 1A View Road. And there's a tree as well for screening. So, sorry. Uh, I'm sorry, so, uh, Councillor Corley Harris. Yeah, I mean, that doesn't really answer the question because it has gone up a story. So the, the angle of sight is completely different. So what is the overlooking? Presumably there has been an assessment of that. Um, so what is the overlooking versus guidance? Yeah, yeah the, the only guidance in place for overlooking would be the, the um, 18 metre rule that we would generally talk about. But in this case, there is already overlooking in place. So um, we have to assess what the level of privacy that garden enjoys at the moment. Um, at the moment, it is overlooked. So um, you really have to then judge, uh, is, is the additional overlooking any worse? Does that really remove any privacy um, from the, those residents? Um, as Valerie said, the distances increase. Um, they don't meet the guidelines, but at the moment, they don't meet the guidelines. Um, and 
again, uh, you know, as as we often say, those guidelines are based on very suburban locations. Um, this is is quite dense um, and has um, quite close relationships. So, um, in this case, we we believe those to be appropriate. That there's no significant loss of privacy. There is some loss of privacy, but it, it, it's not significant enough to um, resist this application. Are there any more questions from the committee? Final chance. Uh, Councillor Bartlett. Um, sorry, could you clarify when you were talking about the loss of um, the, the BR, is it BRE guidelines? Um, and I just wanted to clarify because the objectors talked about it not having a bearing the existing, whether the existing situation was in breach of them or not. So is there a kind of cumulative impact of this or do you treat this as a separate um, assessment of whether it breaches their guidelines, if that makes sense? That's, that's an excellent question. Um, it should be a comparison of existing to proposed. So um, th there's there's different, there's several different tests in the, in the rear area that you've heard about. Um, some measure as a comparison, some measure as a standard. Um, so it's um, passing on, on some and, and, and failing on some, but um, we have to assess in, in the round, is that impact significant? Um, and um, in this case, we find it not to be. Okay, thank you. So, uh, oh, sorry, Councillor Colin Harrison, can we keep it succinctly? That's right. I thought someone else might come in on it, so that's why I, was, I didn't bring it up earlier. It was on... Um, the design and the heritage impact. I assume someone else is going to bring it, but um, it's quite a contradiction again between what officers say um, on the impact on heritage and um, also the, um, I forget the company that provided the heritage assessment, but the, the heritage assessment and what Highgate Society have deemed as um, the impact. So I'm wondering whether the design officer or the planning officer um, can just confirm why they think that there isn't the heritage impact that the Highgate Society are putting forward. Chair, yeah, I think we'll bring in Richard, our design officer, and, and can follow that up with our conservation officer if needed. I was hoping you would say that. Um, yeah. <laughs> I mean, I, my view as a design officer is that this is, uh, a, a, it's an intelligent design that um, has a different design for the North Hill frontage and for the few road frontage that respond to the different context. So on, on North Hill, it's a contemporary reinterpretation of, of Georgian to, to um, complement the neighbouring Georgian listed terrace. And on View Road, it's a contemporary reinterpretation of arts and crafts to complement the neighbouring, um, the, 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 the best buildings in View Road. It's very um, mixed um, picture in View Road, but the best buildings are generally those arts and crafts and uh, sort of Norman Shaw type uh, buildings like the immediate neighbour uh, to the west. Thank you. Are we bringing in the conservation officer? Um, if would you like to hear on, on that perspective as well, or are you satisfied? With... <laughs> well, we have heard from her, so yeah. If um, if you don't feel it that would add anything, we'll, we'll not bring her in. Okay. Thank you. So, any last questions? Okay, so I'll bring uh, Mr. McNaughton in to sum up, please. Thank you, Chair. Yes, um, uh, a number of changes um, that we've um, highlighted. Um, so a, an additional condition 38 um, on the basement, um, that would cover groundwater um, flows and um, the impacts measured on the Burnham scale. Um, and um, the final wording of that, I'll, I'll agree with you, Chair. Um, then um, we have changes to head of term number four to add um, that the obligations are during and, and following construction um, and then an informative um, that with regard to condition three, the brick for the elevation facing North Hill shall be a buff colour. Um, so the recommendation is um, subject to those changes and the addendum. Okay, so the recommendation is to grant permission. So we'll move to the vote. All those in favour? All those in favour, please show.
Okay, those against? And abstentions? Thank you, so that's granted. Thank you, thank you very much everyone, thank you. Point of, point of order, point of order, Chair. Point of order, Chair. It, it, it is now 10 to 10. There have been no uh, requests to adjourn standing orders to allow any further business to proceed after 10 o'clock. And, and, and therefore, I think the, meet, the meeting must now close. No, I think if we start St Anne's, then we can extend the sta we can extend the standing orders. I'm sorry. So I'm sorry. That... I'm sorry, Councillor Rice. So I'm moving on. No, so... no, but but you're not right. Is the question is trying to shout me down about this? Ah, we you, we'll you... only do St Anne's. We won't you, you, do the you other. You have you have to make an application to the meeting to alter the standing orders before quarter to ten. You didn't do that. Um, the, the quarter to ten figure isn't a figure in the constitution, it's just before ten, um, but you can continue with the item that you've begun. So if you begin the next item, you can conclude that one at the chair's discretion. Okay, okay, right, thank you. So we move on. So item ten, the pre-application briefings, that's just for reference on the agenda. And we now move on to item eleven, which is the St Anne's General Hospital, St Anne's Road, N15 3TH. Um, and this is a hybrid. Okay, it's a pre. This is a pre-application. So the uh, um, the planning officer is to introduce the report. Thank you. It's Christopher Smith, the planning officer, to introduce this report. I've got a copy of the standing orders, did you? I've got a copy of the standing orders, did you? Um, hi everyone, um, appreciate it's late, but we'll just do this, this final item. Um, I'm just going to do a, a brief introduction um, to the pre-application and then the, the applicant will talk you through the uh, pre-application scheme. So um, this pre-application proposal is for the demolition of several buildings on site and the provision of up to 995 residential units in multiple buildings of between three and nine storeys in height, flexible non-residential uses, new public realm and green spaces, new routes into and through the site connecting St Anne's Road. Sorry. Conscious of, yeah, conscious is a bit late. I'll slow down. Shall I, shall I start again then? This pre-application proposal is for the demolition of several buildings on site and the provision of up to 995 residential units in multiple buildings of between three and nine storeys in height, flexible non-residential uses, new public realm and green spaces, new routes into and through the site connecting St Anne's Road and Warwick Gardens, and provision of car and cycle parking. The application site includes most of the SA28 site allocation within Haringey's local plan. The site allocation covers the existing hospital land and identifies it for residential and town centre uses, as well as rationalised medical facilities. The St Anne's conservation area covers the northern part of the site, including the Mayfield House building, which is locally listed. The Grey 2 listed St Anne's Church is located a short walk to the east of the site. 
The northern part of the site is designated as a site of importance for nature conservation, an ecological corridor and a tree protection order. The proposed development will come forward in four phases as part of a hybrid planning application. The first phase 1A will be submitted in detail and the following three phases will be submitted in outline form. Phase 1A would include 239 homes, including 36 sheltered accommodation units. 60% of the housing across the whole development would be affordable with 60% of these affordable units provided as London affordable rent units. The council would have an option to purchase 50% of the London affordable rent units. Community land trust homes and housing for the NHS would also be provided. 16% of all housing would have three or more bedrooms and 10% wheelchair accessible homes would be provided throughout the development. Phase 1A would include the refurbishment of the historic hospital buildings, including the existing water tower. The existing peace garden at the centre of the site would be substantially expanded and connected to Chestnuts Park via a new public realm on St Anne's Road. A pedestrian and cycle connection from St Anne's Road through to Warwick Gardens would also be provided in Phase 1A. Officers are generally supportive of the scale, bulk and massing of the development, its overall layout, housing mix and affordable housing provision, phasing arrangements and the proposed land, land uses. The provision of a route through the site, public realm improvements and comprehensive landscaping are other positive aspects of the scheme. The development has been presented to the Quality Review Panel, who generally support the scheme. The panel's most recent comments have been attached to the case officer's report. Members' feedback is being sought at this stage to inform the submission of a detailed planning application in June 2022. I will now hand over to the developers' representatives who will present the proposals and who will be able to answer any questions. Thank you. I just need one minute to upload their presentation. This two. I think they're the same. They're the same. Okay. <laughs> Let's try the low res. I'll just, um, whilst we're just waiting for this to come up, I'll just give a very uh, brief introduction. So thank you very much, officers, uh, for, for giving an overview of the scheme. Thank you, Chair, and hello, uh, councillors. Uh, my name is Rob Reeds and I'm a planning consultant at Lambert Smithampton, along with Rachel and Ed from Karakusevich Carson Architects. We are on be uh, here on behalf of our clients, Catalyst Housing and Hill Group, to present the proposals for the development of the former St Anne's Hospital site. We also have Dave Wakeford from Catalyst and Ross, Ross Williams from Hill, who will be able to assist with any queries should you have any following this brief presentation, which is now on the screen. I understand that some of you visited the site on Wednesday last week, and we hope that you can see from that visit what fantastic opportunity there is to create a high quality new neighbourhood in this part of Haringey. The site is located just off St Anne's Road and was formerly part of the wider hospital site that has recently been progressing its own health led master plan. In 2020, in 2020 Catalyst was selected as the Mayor of London's preferred development partner for this section of the site. Over the past year, we, along with the rest of the team on uh, the subsequent pages, um, have been uh, working with key stakeholders to progress pre-application discussions on the site, which is going to result in a planning application being submitted imminently. The scheme is for the demolition of most buildings on site and the provision for up to 995 new high quality homes. A minimum of 60% of the homes delivered will be affordable, with a compliant tenure split of 60% London affordable rent and 40% as intermediate tenures. The remaining homes, which is 40%, will be private tenure. In addition, there will be new non-residential uses on the site, situated in seven retained buildings and two units within the new blocks. I'm now going to pass over to Rachel, who will set out the site context and wider vision. Thanks, Rob. If we can just move the presentation on um, to the first slide, which is um, the site with the red line boundary, please.
Thanks. So the site is a former fever hospital that has been a medical site since the 16th century. Here you can see the site boundary indicated in red. Buildings shown in orange are the buildings from the 1892 hospital, which are to be retained as part of the proposals. To the north of the site, boundary is St Anne's Road and Chestnuts Park. On the east is the existing NHS Mental Health Trust Hospital. To the south is the railway, which is bordered by a site of important nature conservation, also known as Sink. And to the west are neighbouring streets of residential terrace housing, bordered immediately by Warwick Gardens. The northern part of the site sits within the St Anne's Conservation Area, and this is shown by the yellow hatch on the drawing. At the centre of the site sits the existing Peace Garden, which has many varied species of trees. Next slide, please. Zooming out now, you can see the site at the centre of the drawing. It's just a 10 minute walk from Green Lanes, which is to the southwest, and it forms part of a wider green corridor from Finsbury Park to Tottenham Marshes, which runs east west along the railway line and north south to Chestnuts Park and beyond. I'm now going to hand over to Rob, who will talk you through the proposals. Thank you. Given the size of the site, it will be broken down into four phases, those being phase 1A, which is the top left, phase 1B, phase 2 and phase 3 moving in an anti-clockwise direction. The planning application submission will be a hybrid application, meaning that phase 1A will be sub submitted as a detailed planning application and the rest will be submitted as an outline planning application, which has less detail uh, than, than phase 1A. These phases also relate to the release of the land, uh, the land release by the GLA. I won't go that in, uh, into that now, but if we want to discuss that later, we can do. Um, next slide. The phase 1A will deliver 239 homes, with the outline proposals delivering up to 756 new homes. 60% of the units across the whole site will be um, affordable, 60% being London affordable rent, 18% being London living rent, and 22% being shared ownership in line with council policy. There will also be 38 older adult accommodation homes delivered in phase 1A, set at London affordable rents. The London Borough of Haringey, uh, through their in-house uh, housing team, will have an option of 50% of the affordable dwellings. In terms of non-residential uses uh, proposed in the scheme, the retained the retain buildings in brown uh, will be, um, if you go on to the next slide, sorry, um, will be flexible non-residential uses along with two new ground floor commercial units with pink circles. Uh, the likely end uses will be uh, workspace, um, potentially a small convenience food store and a nursery. Over the past year, we've undertaken a range of pre-application discussions with the London Borough of Haringey, including design, heritage, housing, sustainability, ecology, drainage uh, and transport discussions. We've also met with the Greater London Authority and uh, Haringey's Independent Quality Review Panel four times. The applicants have also run an extensive public engagement program and consultation exercise, including a range of pop-up events, site tours, design workshops, meetings with the community, walk around with councillors and a peace and wellness festival. Feedback from these sessions has helped inform the design. I'm now going to pass back to Rachel and Ed to talk through the scheme design. Thanks, Rob. So our vision seeks to capture the site's unique qualities and sense of place with the four key themes shown on this slide. The first is health legacy, which means embedding memories of the former hospital within the proposals, as well as delivering improved health and well-being for residents. The second is built heritage, where we are retaining key buildings and giving those a new lease of life. The third is nature and ecology, where we are celebrating the existing arboretum of trees and green assets and extending and connecting these spaces through a new layer of landscape. The fourth and final is community, which means learning from the rich local memory and knowledge of the site and adding a new layer of community life and activity. Mm. So looking at the unique qualities of the site in a bit more detail, the existing green landscape has ecological value and there are a number of significant mature trees on site, including at the Sink Woodland, many of which are of local value to the community as well as some rare species such as the veteran spotted thorn. In terms of existing buildings, seven are being retained, of which you can see on the right-hand side of this slide. Starting top left and moving left to right, they are the Peace Building, 
the Admin Building, Mayfield House, Eastgate and Westgate Lodge, Mulberry House and the Water Tower. Next slide, please. So building on this unique ecology and heritage on site, our design approach for the master plan seeks to firmly embed the existing retained buildings within this green heritage of the site. This drawing shows the ground floor layout of the proposed master plan with the existing peace garden, which you can see at the center, which is tripled in size. The retained buildings are shown in pink, and these are conceived of pavilions set within this fantastic landscape amenity. These buildings become focal points in the master plan with new streets and open spaces created around trees and heritage buildings. 